Commission. Thank you all very much for attending. I am going to call roll, and as I call your name, if you will give an audible uh, yay or nay. Commissioner Blackshear? Here. Yay. Commissioner Gobble? Here. Commissioner Johnson? Present. Commissioner Moore? Present. Commissioner Murphy? Present. Commissioner Sims? Present. Commissioner Tibbs? Here. All right, we have a full house. Thank you so very much. Uh, Councilor Kwan, can you walk us through the procedures here, please? On establishing a telephonic meeting? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. As you know, um, state and local law requires that uh, any board or commission when conducting its meeting that they host that they hold those meetings in person. And um, however, due to the ongoing uh, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the governor has issued executive orders, specifically executive order number 16, that will allow boards and commissions to meet electronically or tele telephonically uh, if the business that they are carrying out is number one, essential, and then number two, um, if it furthers uh, the health and well-being of Tennessee. And so before we can proceed to having an electronic or telephonic meeting, uh, I would suggest that the board, uh, excuse me, that the chair solicit a motion to that effect. Thank you so much. If anyone would like to propose a motion to this effect, please raise your hand and remember it's in the lower right corner and I will call on you. For those listening at home, the commissioners can virtually raise their hand through the software we are using. And Council Lady Murphy, I see your hand up. Thank you, I'd like to move uh, the electronic meeting motion. Thank you so much. If anyone would like to second this motion, please raise your hand and I will call on you. Mr. Gobble? I second. Great, we will take a roll call vote. Again, please give me an audible yes. Commissioner Blackshear? Yes. Commissioner Gobble? Aye. Commissioner Johnson? Aye. Commissioner Moore? Aye. Council Lady Murphy? Commissioner Sims? Aye. Commissioner Tibbs? Aye. The motion carries. So now we will need to adopt the agenda. And prior to that, Director Kemp, I know you want to <clears throat> add something to the agenda, please. Yes, thank you. Um, under other business, I would recommend to the commission that we include, include an item for the election of officers. This is um, a vote that we take um, on the second meeting of May each year for the chairman, the vice chairman, the executive committee, as well as our representatives on the parks and historic board. So I can walk you through that once we get to that portion of the agenda, but I would just recommend at this point amending the agenda under other business to include the election of officers. Very good. Does anyone have any issues with that? If so, please raise your hand. Otherwise, we'll accept Director Kemp's modification to the agenda. <clears throat> All right, now if anyone would like to propose a motion uh, to accept the agenda, please raise your hand. Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Chair. I make a motion to adopt the agenda. Thank you. If anyone would like to second this, please raise your hand. Commissioner Tibbs. I second. So the motion has been properly submitted and seconded. I will now take a roll call vote, please. Commissioner Blackshear. Aye. Commissioner Gobble. Aye. Commissioner Johnson. Aye. 
Mr. Moore? Aye. Council Lady Murphy? Aye. Commissioner Sims? Aye. Commissioner Tibbs? Aye. The motion carries. All right, the April, or excuse me, the May 14th minutes were mailed out to everyone and sent electronically. I will need a motion to approve the minutes and if you'll raise your hand, please. Council Lady Murphy. So moved, I make the motion to accept the minutes. And I need a second. Commissioner Sims. I second it. All right, that the motion's properly moved and seconded. Now for a quick roll call vote. Commissioner Blackshear. Aye. Commissioner Gobble. Aye. Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Commissioner Moore. Aye. Council Lady Murphy. Aye. Commissioner Sims. Aye. Commissioner Tibbs. Aye. Great, the motion carries. All right, recognition of council members. Uh, we have lots of council members who have elected to uh, join the meeting. I will call on you and if you wanna speak now or speak before your matter, uh, you can do so. I will go first with Council Lady Gamble. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all commissioners for your service. I just wanna speak very briefly on item uh, 2005 P23008, the Bell Arbor revision and, and final PUD overlay. It is on consent today. And I just wanna go on record as saying that uh, this project has, um, it's, it's, it's a huge project and it has a lot of stages and oh sorry about that we are entering the the last uh phase of this project and there was a lot of concern from the community about uh connection connector streets that were being made from the the new development uh, which is primarily uh single family homes into an existing a community which is primarily rental properties and uh, the, the developer and, and uh, planning staff uh, work together to help to, to come up with a plan uh, to address that and, uh, and including uh, putting not opening up streets altogether or uh, allowing emergency access only and then also adding a sidewalk uh, for pedestrians who are coming from that uh, existing community who can come into the to, into the new community to enjoy a greenway uh, that is being built in there. So I just wanted to to just go on record and, and appreciate all of the work that you all have done to to come to a compromise that that helps um, maintain the integrity of the new development while also still allowing the existing community to connect in a, in a meaningful way. So uh, I appreciate that and thank you. Thank you. Council Lady Roberts. Thank you all. I would like to wait and speak on my case when it comes up. Um, I'd like to speak first, please. Perfect. Council Lady Hancock. Thank you. Um, there are two items on the agenda for my district. We have item 11 on Ferris, which is set to defer to June 11th, and item 26, which was on consent, but I understand it's now and um, being set to defer to June 11th. And I just appreciate you and the entire commission and taking our community feedback into account so that they can be heard and waiting until a time where it's safe for them to do so. Thank you. Councilman Taylor. Thank you. Uh, mostly just here to listen, uh, but uh, uh, there's a few items on the agenda that I see that are gonna be deferred from uh, the district. Uh, and so I probably won't speak on anything else. Just wanted to, to hear more about the details and, uh, and the plans um, as discussed with developers as well as with the community. Thanks so much. Perfect. Councilman Hager. Thank you for allowing me to be here to speak to y'all. I've got item number 10, which I see recommendations defer 
to June the 11th, 2020, which is fine. The other zoning change I had in District 11 is number 23. I think it's on consent. Um, my only concern, and this was something that came out of the meeting the other day, is um, it's going to RM2, which still at this time does not disallow short-term rentals. So that's something I'll discuss more with the developers once I get to the final reading on this bill. Thank you. Councilman Syracuse. Thank you, sir. Just uh, here to support item 18 regarding text amendment for properties impact the tornado that are now non-conforming. It's on consent. Thank you. This is, of course, supportive of that passing and uh, also supportive of item 30, which is the Music Row UDO modification proposal. I'm supportive of that uh, being deferred to June 25th. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. And I know Council Lady Lee has joined us as well. Chairman, it looks like Council Lady Lee has disconnected. Okay. All right, do we have any other council people who may have joined the call that I may have missed? All right, hearing none. Um, we will go to the deferral agenda. Lisa? The following items are for deferral. Um, item number 2015-SP062002. Staff recommendation is to defer to the June 11th Planning Commission meeting. Item number two, 2019 SP 009001. Staff recommendation is to defer to the June 11th meeting. Item number three, 2020 SP 012001. Staff recommendation is to defer to the June 11th meeting. Item number four, 2020 SP 015001. Staff recommendation is to defer to the June 25th meeting. Item number five, 2020 SP 023001. Staff recommendation is to defer to the June 11th meeting. Item number six, 2020 SP 024001. Staff recommendation is to defer to the June 11th meeting. Item number seven, 2018 S 209001. Staff recommendation is to defer to the June 11th meeting. Item number eight, 2019 S 086001. Staff recommendation is to defer to the June 11th meeting. Item number nine, 2019 S 160001. Staff recommendation is to defer to the June 11th meeting. Item number 10, 2020 S 041001. Staff recommendation is to defer to the June 11th meeting. Item number 11, 2020S054001. Staff recommendation is to defer to the June 11th meeting. Item number 12, 2020S066001. Staff recommendation is to defer to the June 11th meeting. Item number 13, 2020S007PR001. Staff recommendation is to defer to the June 11th meeting. Item number 14A, 2020Z008PR001. Staff recommendation is to defer to the June 11th meeting. The associated case 14B, 6177P004. Staff recommendation is to defer to the June 11th meeting. Item number 15A, 2020Z009PR001. Staff recommendation is to defer to the June 11th meeting. The associated case 15B, 88P029001. Staff recommendation is to defer to the June 11th meeting. Item number 16, 2020Z028, PR001. Staff recommendation is to defer to the June 11th meeting. Item number 17, 2020Z071, PR001. Staff recommendation is to defer to the June 11th meeting. Item number 26, 308-84P-001. 
staff recommendation is to defer to the June 11th meeting. Item 29, 2020-SC-019, I'm sorry, 29-A, 2020-SC-019-001. Staff recommendation is to defer to the June 25th meeting. Item 29-B, 8487-P-007. Staff recommendation is to defer to the June 25th meeting. Item 30, 2001-UD-002011. Staff recommendation is to defer to the June 25th meeting. And I would like to note that Commissioners Haynes, Tibbs, and Blackshear are recusing themselves from that item. Item 31, 2019-HT-001001. Staff recommendation is to defer to the July 23rd meeting. Very good. Lisa, let me read these back to you and make sure uh, it's correct. We've got a few additions to the deferral list. Items one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen A, fourteen B, fifteen A, fifteen B, sixteen, seventeen, twenty six. 29A, 29B, 30, and 31. That's correct. Great. I will need a motion for the deferral agenda. If someone will raise their hand, please. Council Lady Murphy. I move approval of the deferral motions. Commissioner Tibbs. I second that. Okay, quick roll call vote. Commissioner Blackshear? Aye. Commissioner Gobble? Aye. Commissioner Johnson? Aye. Commissioner Moore? Aye. Council Lady Murphy? Aye. Commissioner Sims? Aye. Aye. Commissioner Tibbs? Aye. The deferral agenda has been passed with the help of a barking dog. That's good news. All right, for the consent agenda, Lisa? Yes, my dog was voting in support. I apologize for that. Um, we have the following items that are for consent. Um, but first, let me read. As information for those listening, if you are not satisfied with a decision made by the Planning Commission today, you may appeal the decision by petitioning for a writ of cert with the Davidson County Chancery or Circuit Court. Your appeal must be filed within 60 days of the date of the entry of the Planning Commission's decision. To ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements have been met, please be advised that you should contact independent legal counsel. Items on the consent agenda will be voted on at a single time. No individual public hearing will be held, nor will the commission debate these items unless a member of the public or the commission requests that the item be removed from the consent agenda. The following items are on the consent agenda. Item number 18, 2020Z008TX001. It's a request for, to amend Title 17 of the Metro Code to allow non-conforming structures destroyed during the tornado to be rebuilt regardless of the percentage of floor area destroyed. Staff recommendation is to approve a substitute. Item number 19, 2005-P-023-008, Bell Arbor Revision and Final. It's a request to revise a portion of a planned unit development for property located on Brick Church Pike um, to permit 26 multifamily residential units. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions. Item number 20, 2020 NL002001. It's a 306011 in Pike. It's a request to apply a neighborhood landmark overlay district for property located on Levin and Pike to permit an office. A staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Item number 21, 2020Z061PR001. It's a request to rezone from RS5 to R6A for property located on East Moreland Street. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions. Item 22, 2020Z062PR001. 
It's a request to rezone from CS to MULA for property located on Nolansville Pike. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item number 23, 2020Z067PR001. It's a request to rezone from RS15 to RM2 for property located on Old Lebanon Dirt Road. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item number 24, 2020Z068PR001. It's a request to rezone from <coughs> RS10 to R10 for property located on Cardinal Avenue. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item number 25, 2020Z070PR001. It's a request to rezone from RS5 to R88, R8A for property located on Torbett Street. Staff recommendation is to approve. Under other business, item 33, approve Ron Lustig as Downtown Code Design Review Committee Representative for Mayor John Cooper. And item number 37, to accept the director's report. Very good. So let me read that list back to you real quickly. Number 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 33, and 37. That's correct. Very good. I will need a motion to accept the consent agenda, please. Commissioner Tibbs? I move to accept the consent agenda. Commissioner Moore? I second. That is a proper motion with a second. Now I'll take a quick roll call vote. Commissioner Blackshear? Aye. Commissioner Gobble? Aye. Commissioner Johnson? Aye. Commissioner Moore? Aye. Council Lady Murphy? Aye. Commissioner Sims? Aye. Commissioner Tibbs? Aye. Very good, the motion carries, so the consent agenda is accepted, and we will now move to the public hearing items, and if I am correct, Lisa, we will hear items 27, 28, and 32, is that correct? That is correct. Great, for the listeners at home, we have provided multiple ways to participate in this telephonic meeting. Normally, we will take the applicant first, then the supporters, then the opponents. Because of the different ways for people to participate, we'll be taking supporters and opponents together in this telephonic call. To help us, if you will please state your name, your address, and whether you support or oppose the request. For the first case, as usual, we took email comments through Tuesday at 3 p.m. at the start of the public hearing. Lisa will give a summary of how many email comments were received on that item. In addition, we also took voice recordings through Tuesday at 3 p.m. Those will be play, played live during this meeting. We want to thank, thank everyone who took the time to call in advance for keeping your comments within your two-minute time. We do have a call-in number for members of the public who wish to call in and testify. Please wait until the public hearing for your item begins before calling. It is a cue, so we don't want you testifying for the wrong case. For each item, we'll let you know when to call in, and I'll ask Lisa for a count of email comments on each item to give you time to call and talk to our operators. All right, we're ready to begin the first item. Note that the presenting staff is also working remotely for this hearing, and Lisa will operate the slides. Staff? Thank you, Commissioner. This is Greg Claxton with the Planning Department. I'll be presenting item 27, uh, BL 2019-9, regarding sidewalk contributions in lieu of construction. Uh, Lisa, slide. Uh, the proposal is to amend subsection D of section 172020 of the Metropolitan Code, which governs the provision of sidewalks with development or redevelopment. Subsection D allows contributions in lieu of construction when required sidewalks are not required to be built. The current code requires that contributions be spent within the same pedestrian benefit zone as the development. This proposal would change the geography where contributions must be spent uh, from 
uh, pedestrian benefit zones to council districts. Staff's recommendation is to approve a substitute ordinance on a pilot basis with an evaluation. I should also note that according to council office, the proposal inadvertently changes the cap on the contribution. The staff substitute reverts the cap to its current level. Slide, thank you. Um, as a little bit of background, the pedestrian benefit zones and the contribution in lieu were established in subdivision regulations in 2002 and added to the zoning code in 2004. As I mentioned, the section overall governs the provision of sidewalks with development or redevelopment. Subsections A and C identify when sidewalk, sidewalks are required and when installation of sidewalks is not required. Subsection D allows contributions in lieu of construction when sidewalks are not required to be built under subsection C. Slide. Um, embedded within uh, the current code is a little bit of a policy framework um, with three major elements. The first is timing. Contributions should be spent uh, on new sidewalk infrastructure within 10 years of the contribution. Second is uh, that the contribution should, should support similar investments. Uh, they're directed to implement the sidewalk strategic plan, currently walk and bike. And then a little bit more implicitly, based on their, the reference to the pedestrian benefit zones, there's some geographic framework. Um, as we reviewed uh, the history and uh, prior rationales for establishing the pedestrian benefit zones, we identified two major uh, policies um, that, that were uh, used to put together. One is proximity that uh, contribution support investments close to where the, the, the contribution uh, was made. And the second is connectivity, that uh, contributions should not be separated by um, impassable features such as the river or limited access freeways from the investments they support. Slide. To, to give you a sense of the kind of geographies that we're looking at, uh, this map shows uh, in the color blocks, the 16 pedestrian benefits 16 pedestrian benefit zones, and then the 35 council districts are outlined in yellow. We've also shown in the thick white line where the limited access freeways are. And you can see that that's a, a, a major feature in, in us uh, laying out where the pedestrian benefit zones go. Slide. Public Works provided planning staff with an overview of FY19 contributions in lieu. Uh, they amounted to $3.6 million in FY19. Uh, for context, in recent years, Metro uh, typically allocates about $30 million per year in geo bonds through the capital spending plan. So the contributions in lieu extend Metro sidewalk spending by about 10%. Um, I want to explain a little bit about how Public Works collects uh, how Public Works manages the contributions. Uh, because it has a, a large impact in why we're, we're making the recommendation that we are. Um, they collect uh, contributions throughout the year and then allocate them to ongoing sidewalk projects within the pedestrian benefit zone that the contributions came from at the end of the fiscal year. Uh, that means that there's no point at which Public Works looks at these contributions and makes an independent judgment about where they should be dedicated. They only look at what what projects they have going on. That works as a little bit of a random factor, depending on when one project ends and another starts, you know, what happens to be going on at the end of the fiscal year. Um, it's very rare for these in lieu contributions to fully fund a sidewalk project. Uh, based on kind of how uh, the, the contribution fund is managed, um, we feel that one year is, is fairly limited data availability because of that kind of random element of what projects happen to be going on at the end of the fiscal year. Slide. Um, therefore, uh, a summary of our recommendation is to uh, support the proposal um, to change where contributions are in lieu are directed um, from pedestrian benefit zones to council districts, but to do so on a pilot basis. As part of that, we recommend evaluating the contributions by council district after June of 2022. Uh, our default recommendation without further council action would be uh, to revert to pedestrian benefit zones in September 2022. Slide. Um, we spent a, a fair amount of time in the, the staff report um, thinking through what potential policy goals and uh, potential performance met metrics should be for evaluating the use of the uh, contribution in lieu fund um, 
in terms of how it's promoting uh, walkability and the sidewalk program within Nashville. Uh, the first two goals are the ones established through the, through the pedestrian benefit zones, proximity and connectivity. The second would be safety then equity, the prioritization uh, process identified by walk and bike and then unbuilt sidewalks. And the goal would be to identify performance metrics that help uh, public works, us and the council understand um, whether directing contributions in lieu to council districts has any impact uh, on these different areas. Slide. Last, I want to note uh, that it's important to think about the sidewalk program uh, holistically. The contribution in lieu program is one small portion of that um, that functions within that, that broader program. Um, it's important to note that improving the sidewalk program has been a major priority of the, the past couple of years with continued work at the council level through its special committee on sidewalks. Uh, sidewalks and walkability continue to be a key theme in the mayor's transportation listening sessions, and that's continued to have a focus focus uh, by public works planning to, and the planning department on having a data-driven strategic priorities drive the sidewalk program. Additionally, there's an emerging focus as public works is looking for ways to uh, reduce the cost to build sidewalks in Nashville, um, recognizing that we have a limited budget every year for constructing sidewalks and making pedestrian improvements, finding ways to make that, um, that budget go further in terms of uh, improvements to this, the, the walking environment in Nashville is critical. Slide. Uh, therefore, staff recommends approval of a substitute to change uh, where contribution in lieu fees, or contributions in lieu are directed to council districts uh, and to establish an evaluation period, preparation of a report, and sunset clause. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. <clears throat> Council A. Roberts, I think you are the applicant here. Is that correct? That is correct. All right, we will let you have the floor. All right, well, here it goes. Well, I, first of all, as always, I wanna thank you all for your service. We all appreciate what you all do and, and donating your time is, is, is invaluable. Um, I've been working on this with Council Lady Angie Henderson, the planning department, of course, and public works diligently um, on this legislation to ensure that we addressed as many of those concerns as possible so we could get this right. Uh, the impetus for this legislation was that my district is currently divided into three pedestrian benefit zones. And although we brought in over $2 million, we have zero sidewalks to show for it. Um, number one request I get from my constituents is for sidewalks and to make their community a more pedestrian friendly place to live and to work. And delivering small projects like traffic calming, roundabouts, sidewalks, uh, crosswalks, bike lanes, and connections to parks and schools are all the tangible things at the district level that impact my community the most. Um, people are literally crying out to us for these things, and this legislation will help with that because right now we only have one way to get projects done and that's through the capital improvements budget. And most of these things that I just listed are too small for the CIB. So for these small to mid-sized projects that impact the community the most are falling through the cracks. Um, as Council Lady Angie Henderson referred to it, this legislation addresses the issues that are basically CIB light. And I thought that was kind of a clever way to say it, but that, that, that's what these mid-sized projects uh, really are. We're, we are basically 70 years behind on our sidewalk plans. And the ROI on these smaller projects from a community standpoint is much more relevant. And it gives my constituents and everyone's constituents instant gratification from where their tax dollars are actually being spent. Um, in this current political environment, we need transparency more than ever. We need the ability to deliver smaller, more impactful projects more quickly for the benefit of walkers and for bikers. Most people don't see the benefit of the in lieu money being spent on big projects outside of their own neighborhood. They just don't. They wanna be able to cross their own street without being afraid. And this legislation addresses that. 
in my district, as well as in many others, kids walk in ditches to school, like on James and Burgess Avenue. We have handicapped people who live on connector streets that aren't ADA compliant, like O'Brien and Annex and 46th Avenue. Um, Osceola Avenue desperately needs traffic calming. And these are just a few of the smaller projects that could be immediately addressed with this legislation. I plan to work with Council Lady Henderson, who we all know is the godfather of all things sidewalk. And in her role as the chair of Public Works Committee, um, I plan to work with her, the council, the planning department, and Public Works to give a, the public a transparent process for the selection of which projects will be done. And today I'm asking for your support. Thank you so very much. Let me remind everyone, if you would mute your phones, if you are not speaking, that would certainly help the telephonic meeting to go much more smoothly. Uh, Lisa, did we receive any voice messages on this item? We received, we did not receive any voicemails on this item. Okay. Then we are now ready to take calls from the members of the public who wish to call in. Um, your screens should show the call-in number. As a reminder, please only call in on this current case. When you begin your testimony, please state your name, address, and whether you support or oppose the item. Uh, as a quick reminder, we're not able to display a timer visually, but Sean will be keeping track of the time. She will give you a 30-second warning when your, time, when your two minutes is nearly up. She will also let you know when your time is up so that we can disconnect and move on to the next caller. Prior to that, Lisa, did we receive any emails on this item? We did receive two emails on this item, both in support and one from Council Member Henderson. Very good, and I wanna thank all those who took the time to email in uh, their input. Sean, do we have any callers for this item? Chairman, we do have some, the phones are ringing. It's gonna take us just a moment to get the first folks queued up, um, but bear with us just a second here. Very good. Hello? Chairman, while we're waiting to queue the folks into the meeting, I might um, note that you do have several council members who are also participants and um, um, you might, at the close of the call-in uh, opportunity, see if any of them or anyone of the other participants would want to speak on this item for I see that Council Lady Benedict has joined us. Um, so um, we, will, we will put the first caller in, and then I might recommend seeing if any council members as participants would like to speak as well. Very good. Um, so we will now take the first caller. Sean, if you'll put them in. Caller, and please go ahead. Yes, you have the caller. All right. Um, hi, everyone. Wanted to start by saying thank you. Um, my name is J.S. Bolton. I'm the president of the Nation's Neighborhood Association. And I'm speaking in favor of this. Am, am I in the meeting now? You are in the meeting, yes ma'am. Please go ahead. Hi. Hello. Oh, so it's it's delayed. Okay, okay, I understand. Sorry about that. Yep, yeah, you, you will need to mute your TV screen because there is a delay as a quick reminder. Caller, please go ahead. All right, starting over. Sorry about that, a little confusing. That's quite all right. So, <laughs> my name is J.S. Bolton. I'm president of the Nation's Neighborhood Association, and I'm calling in favor of this bill. As Mary Carolyn said, um, sidewalks are the number one priority of our neighborhood. 
And we know that because we held a visioning session last year, attended by about 50 neighbors um, and moderated by the National Civic Design Center. We voted on various priorities. Sidewalks are the most important thing. Um, we prioritized which streets we wanted. The neighborhood reached out to Public Works. And as many of you know, the Nations is a neighborhood where we have had a lot of new construction and a lot of money has gone into the in lieu of funds, but we haven't seen sidewalks in return. On my street, I live on Indiana Avenue, we have a patchwork. Two houses will have a sidewalk, the next three houses will have no sidewalk. Then another one house will have a sidewalk, then four houses without a sidewalk. The reason I'm in favor of the bill is because I think it's very, very important for the neighborhoods that are contributing to the in lieu of funds to see the benefit of the sidewalk. I have some concerns that um, it, even within a council member's district, it doesn't get as specific as the sidewalks go where there are no sidewalks. You know, it can go somewhere else within the district. Um, so, you know, the nations contribute perhaps a sidewalk gets built in Charlotte Park, but it still seems uh, better than it is right now, which is, as I understand it, based on looking at sidewalk construction projects, there has been nothing built in the nations in the last three or four years. So this bill hopefully will address the concerns of the neighbors and make our neighborhood a little bit safer. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sean, if you'll put the next caller in, please. Chairman, you should have the next caller now. We'll have two minutes. Go ahead, please. Yes, my name is Robert Goose. Uh, I am also in the nation's um, member of the nation's neighborhood association, and. Um, because of the delay in the system, I actually don't know all the comments uh, that they have to provide provide my own. Uh, I support an amendment to the in lieu of fund process, but I do have some reservations about the, the current procedure. Uh, I feel as though the in lieu of monies should really, as much as possible, leave neighborhoods in the same place as a developer building sidewalk. I've seen this by actually being on organizations that work with developers and neighborhoods to see how projects are approved. And there's a real substantive difference on whether a sidewalk gets built in your neighborhood based on whether a developer builds it themselves or pays into the Lua Fund. It creates a really bizarre set of incentives and a point of potential contention that doesn't have to be there between developers finding the best path forward for their project and neighbors looking out for the uh, development of sidewalks in their neighborhood. So I would suggest a simple substitution or amendment to make it so that the first number one priority for in lieu of funds is that they actually get spent on the property that pays in the in lieu of money. And if Metro does not see itself within those 10 years or, or promptly spending the money to actually build sidewalks where a developer is being asked to pay in, then I think it it calls on us to reevaluate whether why we're asking that developer for that land to pay into a fund. When How are you at 30 seconds? Okay, thank you uh, for 30 second warning. So I think when, uh, as I was saying, when a uh, developer has that choice, <laughs> like if a, if a veteran is not planning to build promptly a sidewalk on a property, we have to ask ourselves why are we asking a developer to make that choice of paying to the lower fund. Um, Anyway, I would I would try to make the lower fund as much as possible actually funding the property or sidewalks contiguous with the property that pays in those monies. Uh, but if that is not feasible, I do support any measure that narrows the window with uh, a ge geographic window where these funds could be spent. I would also like a more public. Uh, your time is up. If you could wrap up your thoughts, please. Thank you. Last, uh, I'd like a, a more public and open process for how those uh, sidewalk monies are to be spent. And if they're being spent outside of the property that paid in, that some sort of rationale or just justification be shared with the public. Right now, we're trying to stay informed as best we can, and it feels a little opaque. 
Uh, thank you for your time, and uh, I really appreciate everyone's efforts on this bill. Thank you. Thank you for your input. Sean, the next caller, please. Chairman, we have no other callers on the line here at this time. Um, we just wanted to remind you that you may want to um, go to the council members who have joined the meeting and have their hands up, and we'll, um, we can check in again to see if there are any additional calls when you've done that. Perfect, and I see Council Lady Benedict's hand up. Would you like to speak? Thank you, Chair. Yes, I would. Um, I, uh, and thank you, Commissioners, and for the great work that you do. Uh, Council Member Roberts has spent a lot of time on this, as has Council, um, Council Lady, uh, sorry, Henderson. And I was the chair of the Special Committee on Sidewalks, which was referenced in this presentation. And as we know from that, um, I just would echo some of the comments you just heard, which is this is one of the hottest topics in the city. Um, maybe the budget is a bit hotter right now, but as it relates to constituent services, sidewalks really impacts the, 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 the way of life for Nashvilleians. And so it's important that as we, as we continue to grow in density, as you know, that we put these in in as many places as possible and where we can't or where we have allowed someone to pay the in lieu of fee, I completely support what Council Member Roberts has, and Henderson have put forward here. So this aligns with some of the findings from that special committee on sidewalks, and I would ask that you um, also support it as amended. Thank you. Thank you. Any other council people wishing to speak, please raise your hand. Council Lady Murphy. Thank you, Chairman. I think that Council Lady Henderson is hoping to get on the call, but she is um, she's still traveling at this time. So I don't I'm I don't know on procedurally if if we start discussion if we can come back to her to to reopen the public hearing for her to speak or or not. But I think she if we don't see her on the line, I think a little bit ago she was about twenty minutes out from being able to get on the phone. Well, and we also have an email from her if she can't join the call. All right, Council Lady Roberts, any closing remarks? No, I just ask for your support. Great, then I will uh, close the public hearing and start the discussion among the commissioners. And I'm going to call on Council Lady Murphy to actually go first. Well, how did I know that was coming? <laughs> um, so I have a lot of thoughts on this one. Um, the, it, the sidewalk, our sidewalk legislation at the council um, has not been has not been edited or updated as much as the Airbnbs have over the last, uh, you know, six to eight years. Um, what what I am concerned about anytime we set in place legislation, and this is this is an argument we hear a lot from the Airbnb um, supporters uh, and opposition, is that we've got to kind of set a framework, live in that framework, um, and evaluate that framework. Um, so. With that being said, I think that we have had this, these large benefit zones for a long time, and I think everyone on the council and the majority of the public would agree that they're not perfect, that um, the system we have in place is not perfect. Um, you know, one of my first meetings when I was elected in 2015 was sitting down with Public Works, and they put in front of me three sidewalks, uh, three proposed sidewalks that they picked out for me to pick from. Um, and so, you know, I, I, yay, it's great that I get to pick a sidewalk for my district, but should, should I be the one picking which sidewalk in which neighborhood gets it? Um, and so there are a few things that stick out in, in the staff report that I wanted to draw some attention to and make just a few more comments and I'll try to be quick. So first is um, in the overview, the, the staff says that one expectation is that one outcome of the proposed change is that the in lieu program would be used to support much smaller projects at the district level 
rather than larger sidewalk programs that serve more people. Um, you know, do I want lots of small projects? Do I want a few big projects? This is a little confusing on whether I might end up getting fewer small projects and fewer big projects, it sounds like, because we're, we're um, chopping things up a little bit more. Um, I also, they, the, the staff report in the policy context says, one result of this pilot may be that the in lieu fund can only support, again, much smaller projects within a district that generates the fund. And I have concerns about the equity of that um, countywide, because as we know, there are some districts that have seen rapid growth. There are some districts that have not seen that rapid growth. And rapid growth can mean different things. There, you know, downtown has changed a lot and it's and and they have sidewalks. But, you know, there are some districts on the on uh, outside of the urban core that are not seeing the type of development that would trigger an in lieu fee. And so, you know, I'm I'm a little concerned because we have a great uh, piece of legislation that our last council passed. I think we passed it unanimously. Um, and and this was not a huge debate at the time over council districts versus benefit zones. Um, and again, that could be chicken and egg and what do you do first? But but this hasn't been a huge debate at the at the council level over benefit zones. Um, I think that we there has been discussion about benefit zones being smaller um, and seeing the benefit of that because ultimately I think I would rather see a study of what we currently do um, and then after redistricting look at smaller benefit zones evaluate that and then we could evaluate council districts my concern is just jumping into council districts and evaluating it we don't have a good baseline to to compare the data to for example I've been in office for four years. I have been able to a, a pick slash approve three sidewalk projects in my district. That first sidewalk project was funded under the previous councilman and it's still being built right now. So 37th Avenue, that sidewalk uh, picked my first few months in office and it was funded literally prior to me beginning office and it has not finished now. So again, I'm worried about, uh, you know, we won't have the big meaningful projects that actually serve a lot of people. Um, I think right now we are getting a good mix of big and small projects. Um, and something that's important is that, and this is why I think the pedestrian zones were, were created the way they were, um, even if I think they might need to be tightened up, is that pedestrians um, and pedestrian needs do not know council boundaries. And in fact, often major intersections and streets um, that have fatalities or have uh, pedestrians walking in unsafe circumstances, they're often boundary lines. And so how, how does that work when, when the money for District 24 has to stay in District 4, but White Bridge Road and Charlotte Avenue is split between my district and Council Lady Roberts? And fortunately, that's a very safe district, but that's just an example of a major intersection that is, that's a boundary. Same with um, uh, a sidewalk that I'm pushing for and have two phases on Woodmont Boulevard. Um, I've gone almost to my district boundary line and then Councilman Foley will have to pick up the football and carry it from there. Um, I do, I hear the concerns about sidewalks being, um, kind of just here and there polka dotted all over the neighborhood and the need to complete those. And, and that definitely takes time. And we have to evaluate, is it more important to fill in the gaps or is it more important to get the big sidewalk projects done in areas like South Nashville where they are not seeing the growth and the in lieu fees paid, but they are in desperate need of, of these sidewalks. Um, I'm just, again, very concerned about that equity. I'm concerned that this timeline of this report and the evaluation period is not realistic, given the fact that it's taken over four years to build one, one sidewalk at my district, like I mentioned previously. I'm wondering why Public Works, and I would challenge Public Works to, to, to look at their data and see if they could do, if we're gonna do a study on the council districts moving forward, can they not do a retrospective look 
with the same metrics of what we've done in the past. I, again, I'd feel better having that data baseline. Um, so uh, kind of wrapping up my thoughts here, because I've been jumping around, concerns about the socioeconomic needs of the council districts and different parts of the county and different quadrants of the county. I really feel that we must work together and share the wealth to get safety improvements where they're needed the most first. Um, if that means another district has a greater need or has more fatalities or more um, injuries than, than my district, then, then that in, intersection or that part of Nashville should take priority over other districts or other projects that, that do not score as high. And again, when I say score high, that's not a positive scoring high. That's They're scoring high because they're dangerous intersections and dangerous roads. I'm just worried that this is going to uh, continue to grow the disparity amongst neighborhoods, and it will lead to um, kind of the haves and have nots when it comes to safety. We hear a lot of, well, because it's budget time, we hear a lot about schools, which schools underperform, which schools uh, overperform, what neighborhood do you want to try to buy into so your child can go to the best school? Well, are we going to be setting up where you're neighborhoods are now going to be de deemed as safe and not safe because they have a sidewalk on every street because they were fortunate and wealthy. Um, so ultimately, I, I would like to see an evaluation or the matrix that is the re that we're going to be doing this report on, um, done on, on what we have now, or if they could retro, you know, go back and look at the data, that would be great. But I'm, I'm just concerned without having that that I think the report is great, but without having that baseline, I'm scared to make the jump into council districts um, without that, that baseline report. I'd rather see that first. I am glad that there is a sunset in this and that there is a that, that it's considered a pilot, but I'm not completely sold that this is the best thing for all of Nashville. So, but I'll, I would love to hear everybody else's thoughts. Thank you, Council Lady. Commissioner Tibbs, I'm gonna go next to you. Man, I kind of knew you were coming to me too. Um, actually, I really appreciate that, Councilman Murphy, because um, my initial thought was, you know, this was, uh, I, I was, I was actually pretty supportive of it. I do kind of stop with question now. Um, and you mentioned those, um, I mean, and you're, that was just a, actually a good point that there are certain areas that are, um, you know, neglected, or maybe that's not even the right word, but just they need it, you know, uh, more stringently than necessarily the area that the, the money, you know, uh, originated. Maybe that's the best way to, to, um, to clarify it. Um, pedestrian benefit zones, I wanted to say that right. <clears throat> um, uh, and, and there are certain areas, you know, just driving around that you will note that probably uh, could have more benefit. And they they tend to be in areas, as you point out, of high population, like in South Nashville, where maybe there are more people using public transportation and need those sidewalks. Um, and um, so you that's actually, uh, I'm just kind of saying all this to actually support what you have already said, but I think that that I, I, I didn't realize that initially, but I, that makes a lot of sense uh, because uh, there would, you know, sometimes in those areas may not get the development too, that maybe certain other areas to get that that would be, um, if I'm understanding it correctly, but that would, that would all go into. Um, I, I, you know, because I was kind of swayed by listening to your um, response, I too want to listen to what my other um, commissioners might say. Uh, maybe there's uh, another point that I would value as well. But right now, um, I do have some concerns about it. Very good. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Sims? Yes, sir. Uh, first of all, I just really need to say to Greg Claxton what an amazing job he's done on this. And uh, Mr. Claxton is doing a great job with the department in trying to lead us all toward more policy, evidence-based policy making. And this is such a prime example of where our city needs to go. And 
not only are we behind on, as um, Councilwoman Roberts said, on building sidewalks, but we're really behind on how we evaluate the effectiveness of either current or potential public policy. I think evidence-based policy making um, is my passion and it does, when used well, promote transparency, accountability. It gives us a purpose and a direction for changing policy. The problem I have with this right now is that we don't have a baseline data on the current program to know if it's working or not. There's a lot of anecdotal evidence and probably for every story that neighborhoods have that are really accurate, there are other stories where they benefited from it. And I think the commission is really charged with advising the best we can about policy. I have a concern about changing this with any type of evaluation at this point and echo Councilwoman Murphy's concerns about the realism of the timeline. To actually implement any kind of good program, especially performance-based um, metrics in our environment would require a dedication of time, resources, and staff expertise. And I'm not sure that our city has that right now. Um, and so I, I am concerned that we're gonna change this and there's no baseline de data that reflects the need to change. And if we do this kind of evaluation in only a matter of two years, and I can guarantee you based on my experience across not just our nation, but our world in evaluating programs, it'll take us a year to get the infrastructure for evaluating well a program. So I have some concerns about um, certainly applaud us trying to move toward evidence-based policy making. Certainly have some concerns that we're making decisions on something that pretty much still was formed in 2002. And we all know our, pro our neighborhoods have changed significantly since 2002. Well, I think it is time for us to revisit this, but I think in some ways this is important as many of the policies that's taken us a very long time to get right. And we probably ought to spend some more time really trying to get this right. Thank you. Commissioner Moore. Thank you. Um, like Commissioner Tibbs initially when we getting over the staff report um, and looking at this case, um, I was pretty much in support of it, but um, during the um, public hearing and just kind of listening to some of the comments and the presentation, um, I too was really concerned about um, equity here as if, you know, this passes as is, it could be very um, piecemeal based on those um, areas that are being highly developed, leaving so many behind that are in areas that um, don't have much development going on. Um, and especially with those living in those areas, meaning sidewalks the most, sometimes not having vehicles to get around, using public transportation. Um, so I'm in much of um, agreement of what uh, Council Lady Murphy shared um, and can feel like you really do need a little more information um, about how things are going now and what's working, what's not uh, before we pass something like this. Thank you. Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I do appreciate uh, previous uh, comments uh, that came from uh, our commissioners. And I do appreciate uh, Council Lady Roberts and our staff, uh, uh, Mr. Claxton, Claxton had a tremendous work uh, came into uh, this legislation. And it's no secret, everybody wants sidewalks and every single neighborhood wants sidewalks. So the unfortunate thing is we have just limited funding. Uh, last I remember, you know, we do have great uh, plan to, you know, where sidewalk need to be built. So if I remember correctly, uh, last uh, evaluation was, it would take us about 20 to 25 years under the current funding level. So any in lieu of, you know, any funding source and try to uh, accelerate sidewalks project is, you know, where we need to think about. And one thing, 
you know, uh, previous uh, commissioner mentioned is uh, equity, safety and equity how we can accomplish that. So by putting uh, in the current uh, pedestrian benefit zone, is it benefiting or encouraging more safety and distributing more equity? Or if we go to, you know, council level uh, project that will provide more equity. And I think not having uh, current matrix and where uh, the in lieu of uh, money was spent uh, in the past um, years and so forth, uh, we would not have any uh, point to evaluate uh, which matrix or which mechanism is the right one just go with a current system or just try a uh, council uh, district uh, metro, uh, system. So I, w as, as other commissioners, I would like to see the existing, you know, past uh, data where in lieu of uh, sidewalks uh, fund was used and where all the sidewalks was built. And so that's, so if we were to break down into that uh, council district in that sense, does it, you know, distribute uh, more equity? So I think I would like to request those data before we decide uh, this item one way or the other. Thank you so much. Commissioner Gobble? Well, I kind of agree with the other commissioners. First of all, I think I was I think the staff's logic and excellent work on their part to put this together. Uh, and I was certainly moving down this path. I was concerned about district borders and those kind of things. Uh, but Council Lady Murphy's comments were certainly on point. And it would probably be a good idea that we asked, I don't know how long it would take to accumulate this data, but. Um, it would be uh, it would probably be appropriate if we deferred this to that point, and I would support that kind of effort, uh, assuming that's the data that we can achieve. I mean, we can get the data. That's my comment. All right, let, let's take a pause real quickly. I know we have someone from Public Works, uh, Mr. Jeff Hammond, on the phone with us, and perhaps he can speak and clarify what data is available for the record uh, to help us um, clarify this issue before we go to Commissioner Blackshear. Mr. Hammond. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I will do that in, in, in doing that and talking about the data, I think it's fitting to just make sure we recap and talk a, a little bit uh, briefly about how we actually allocate these funds currently. And that, because I think that gives some idea of what data may be available and then I'll get into what, what is and, and what is not available. Um, so beginning at the, at the time in which a developer is allowed to and pays into the ANUA fund that is paid to representatives of the codes department at the one-stop uh, development shop. Uh, those come to us uh, really the same day. Uh, when that money is paid in, we have a record of that and we then attribute that and make a deposit for those funds into an appropriate one of 16 pedestrian benefit zone uh, business units that we track in our finance office at Public Works. Uh, we don't really look at that uh, for uh, at least a, uh, for about a year, uh, sometimes less, but we, we only really pull that information out after we um, made all those deposits over the course of the year. And at the end of the fiscal year, we, we tally that up and we look at uh, how much uh, in lieu of money has gone to each um, into each pedestrian benefit zone. Of course, we have it by address, so we know exactly what property paid into it and then of course where that pro what district that property is in so we know both how much districts have, um, have contributed to the fund and how much uh, pedestrian benefit zones 
have contributed. And then what we do is go through really a financial exercise. It's an, it's an administrative exercise that looks at how much money do we have coming out of uh, each zone and what projects do we have ongoing at that time to credit those accounts with. Uh, that's why when you, when you look at it and, and say, you know, what was built from the in lieu of monies, well, in, in some sense, nothing was built from the in lieu of monies because they were projects that were ongoing anyway, uh, but, but we have used, uh, used the in lieu of money to further all of them. By that same measure, you could say, well, the in lieu of money has been used to build every sidewalk project in Nashville in a way because uh, we, we, it just furthers uh, the capital money that the, the council gives us to build sidewalks with. Uh, one thing we don't do is we don't we don't take that and say, well, let's let's take this in lieu of money and go build a curb ramp or a crosswalk or a pedestrian signal, it, any of which would be very fitting and fine projects to do. Um, but we don't do that currently, and I think that's where some of the the request has come from. That, that why don't we take a look at that? So um, the the information that we do have available, uh, as Mr. Claxton indicated uh, during the presentation, is is one year long, and and the only four four year that we have this um, uh, in lieu of account information on is fiscal year 19, soon to be fiscal year 20 because our fiscal year uh, is, is um, about a month away from being ended. So we will soon have two years. We currently have one year uh, worth of full data. The reason we don't have more and can't go back in, you know, in, into years past and do the same type of analysis, as I understand it, uh, has to do with um, the, some of the conversion activities that Metro went through last year converting from a, uh, an accounting system called EPS to R12. I, I can't get into the details of that because I don't know them. That's about as much as I know, but we lost a lot of the functionality to be able to, to slice and dice those accounts uh, in, in order to take a detailed look uh, at years past, unfortunately. So when we talk about the data that we have available, I, I can give you the, the projects that, um, that the in lieu of money went to in fiscal year 19 but it's simply a list of projects and it's a relatively short one because again, it was only projects that happened to be under construction at that time. And if we, even if we were able to go uh, back in time and, and do that for years past, you would get the same type of relatively small list of projects. Thank you so much. Commissioner Blackshear, we will close with you. Um, I thought that was really helpful from Public Works. That actually answered a lot of my questions. Um, and because I, one, needed that type of clarification from Public Works and to kind of piggyback on one of the comments um, that one of the callers made, to the extent that any pilot program is developed, whether it's this one or one that's um, implemented, perhaps substitute ordinance, um, I think it would be well advised of us to encourage transparency in the whole process, um, especially obviously we're talking about where the funds are going to be used. That's, that's where um, all the controversy is to allow it to be more transparent. I don't have any great ideas on how to do that, but more transparency involved in engaging the public, uh, especially obviously at particular district levels about where that money is being used. And maybe that's something that, um, the staff and public works has already thought about in particular with this program, but it is something that would be helpful as we um, do an evaluation process, whether it be through this ordinance or another one. Thank you. We will now need a motion. So Wait, someone Mr. Will raise. Mr. Chairman, Go ahead. forgive me. This is Go ahead, Lucy. Director. Um, I wanted, uh, just because I, I get a sense from a couple of the commissioners who are interested in um, a deferral, I wanted to speak to a couple of, of, of aspects. One is substantive and one, in, and one is procedural there. First of all, I realize that text amendments are more complex usually than your average zoning case. And so um, there are a lot more policy factors and the like that I know the commission would want to chew on. Um, I think that it would, it, whatever motions you make, it would be very helpful to give the staff sort of some specific guidance for us to 
use as we think through some of these issues, and you put a lot of helpful information on the record, um, but we want to make sure that our future work is productive. Um, on the um, on the sort of procedural side, there are two things that I think we need to consider. One is um, that whatever we do, it is most helpful for public works to have a um, clean accounting for a full fiscal year. And so I don't want a scenario where we defer it for a couple of weeks or a month because based on the council schedule, um, I think that would possibly put us into a weird spot with public works. And so I think that's something we may need to get some clarification on from, from Mr. Hammond um, uh, as if we need to clarify that. But that's the first is whatever system we leave in place, it, it, it needs to be for the full fiscal year. The second is, and I would ask Lisa um, to assist me here, um, there, are, um, there are council rules that relate to um, how council treats the Planning Commission recommendations in terms of timing. And so um, I would like to ask Lisa to speak to that given the trajectory we're on here um, and that may lead us to some advice about just going ahead and taking a vote as opposed to deferring so that the council member sort of has a decision and public works has a decision. Do you mind if I go ahead and ask Lisa to clarify where we are in terms of the process? Please go ahead. Hi, Lucy. So there, there is a council rule um, that essentially says that when a bill is um, introduced at council, um, that it needs to be referred to the Planning Commission. The timing then essentially says that um, the public hearing can't be held on that bill until there's a recommendation from the Planning Commission or 30 days have passed. Um, we're in the timing position with this bill where the public hearing is scheduled for June 9th. Um, 30 days has passed since introduction because it was introduced, um, gosh, in I think October. Um, and so we are beyond sort of the 30 days. And so the public hearing can go forward um, on the 9th. Um, the third reading would be the very next week. So essentially, um, if the Planning Commission hasn't taken action by that point um, for the purposes of council and uh, vote requirements, it is considered an approval. Thank you, Lisa. All right, any other further comments or questions from the commission before we ask for a motion? Council Lady Murphy. Thank you, Chair. Um, I Surely we are not the only city that struggles with with sidewalk issues, sidewalk drama. Um, I say drama over the fact of like, it's stressful. Like our constituents want sidewalks and I want to give them sidewalks. Um, I, I guess I don't know if this question is to, to planning or to public works or both. Um, a lot of times like, and, and I wish Council Lady Henderson was able to get on, but she's texted me saying that her call keeps getting dropped um because i think she's just in a bad zone um you know when i write re legislation i usually look at like what other cities do um now we don't always want to reinvent the wheel of what we have right we we have a system in place it's been it's you know slowly going along and things but i would love to know a comparison of what other cities do and i don't know if that has been put together and i've just uh missed that because we have a lot going on all the time but also um uh, I think that, yeah, I guess, I guess I would just like to hear if, if, if there is any sort of, of report already put together comparing our program with other similar cities programs. Okay, so, Lisa, can, can you take that question, please? So, count, uh, so, Chair, this is Lucy. First, um, we are confirming, we think we do have Council Lady Henderson on the line, um, but we're confirming that. Um, 
the we did a fair amount of peer research during um, the initial um, uh, drafting of the sidewalk ordinance several years ago. Um, so I don't I don't know specifically how the in lieu program was handled. I do know that that in Atlanta there's a in lieu program and it goes towards sidewalk construction at the site where the in lieu. Um, was given, so it's much more specific. Um, I think that one of the big challenges in Nashville, as everyone knows, is that we developed many residential areas without um, building sidewalks, or in some instances, setting aside the land to do that. And so now we're going back and retrofitting, which is an enormous challenge. I don't know of another similarly sized city that's trying to accomplish that piece on the scale that we are. Um, so, um, uh, but if, if you want more information about sort of in lieu programs, um, I, I think we could send that over unless um, Public Works, do you have any, Mr. Hammond, do you have anything you'd wanna add? It's kind of hard, I can't see any anyone to know if there's additional comments on that question. Uh, not specific to in lieu of payments and how those payments are, are allocated over the geography, but we do have, um, you know, some some history of looking at peer cities in the development of the walk and bike master plan, which sets forth our prioritization process and the way we do that. I think is comparable with with uh, other other jurisdictions, large and small, really, in terms of prioritizing those for safety and equity and. Uh, destinations and those types of things, but not specific to uh, the geography over which something like an in lieu of payment would be uh, executed to my knowledge. That has not been looked at from a peer standpoint. Um, Mr. Chair, I think um, Council Lady Henderson is on the call and given that she was the original sponsor of the pedestrian zone um, sort of legislation, it might be helpful to get her perspective on the on the question about um, peer cities, for example, um, if you would entertain that. Sure, let's see. Uh, the council lady has joined the call. We would love to hear from her. Uh, thank you, Chair. Can you, can you hear me? We can. Okay, wonderful. I apologize. I am I'm up in, in the mountains and was having a little difficulty um, making the connection. So I appreciate your patience. Um, so, uh, you know, with apologies, having not been able to hear your, your previous discussion, if, if I, you know, share anything that's redundant to what staff has already shared, please just kind of put me uh, on the right track. Um, uh, Ms. Kemp, I think uh, you were right on target. I mean, we are, we're kind of retrofitting, we're working backwards. Um, we did not have um, the kind of sidewalk requirements it would have been great to have in place uh, post WW2 and we kind of sprawled out with car oriented development and uh, you know did not build sidewalks at that time. So you know the strategic framework that was established by uh, the legislation, um, you know, there, there was a logic to it. It's not just sidewalks everywhere. And so we do acknowledge that there are times, typically in a suburban context, um, where there's not an immediately adjacent sidewalk that for engineering reasons, whether they be stormwater or otherwise, you know, it, it doesn't make sense to build that segment. Um, um, but, uh, but based on the strategic framework that we've established per the walk and bike strategic plan, we know that that is an area where uh, we want and need sidewalks, um, whether that's its proximity to a center, um, its uh, location on a collector street that has a higher car volume. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to be very intentional in that, you know, when we have a suburban development pattern, neighborhood classified street, uh, you know, that's, those aren't really the best places to make the investments. And so we can calm those streets, make them safer for walking uh, at, the, at the neighborhood scale. Um, but when you get out that collector, uh, that arterial, um, you know, that, that's where you need this, this infrastructure. So, um, you know, it, it, uh, I, I think what I have been um, seeing, and I currently serve as, as chair of the Public Works Committee, um, so Mr. Hammond and I, you know, speak uh, quite a bit as far as the sidewalk program and sidewalk delivery. 
And um, I think this council has done a good job. We're still kind of uh, evolving, but, you know, getting to a place where we have more uh, uh, objectivity and transparency in our, in our capital spending. Um, but, you know, feedback that I've been sort of seeing and, and, and or rather hearing and, and getting is that, you know, uh, for these major projects um, that are very kind of significant, um, you know, those take a lot of time and there really is a high need of, uh, you know, to the pedestrian benefit per the intent of the legislation. There is a high need for, um, uh, you know, pedestrian benefits such as, uh, you know, crosswalks, um, improved uh, crossing signalization at intersections, um, traffic calming on those streets to help people be able to walk where they need to go, building out that network um, in within smaller investments that really are have a really high ROI, a good return on investment. And so, you know, I think the spirit of the legislation, these were established as pedestrian benefit zones. Um, and I think, you know, what I'm hearing from the community and from council members is, you know, when somebody you know, gets that waiver and does not build that sidewalk, it, it, that's fair and that's right, but there was a reason that we required it there. And so, you know, in that spirit, in that same, you know, area, the, the community does really feel it as a palpable loss. You know, it's kind of like, oh man, we didn't get that sidewalk. So, uh, you know, community members want to see a fairly quick turnaround um, from a delivery perspective of, you know, getting a uh, getting crosswalks down. Um, you know, we have looked at intersections that we have, um, every district has them, right? I think every council member in a very objective and fair way could give you five places that they need a crosswalk in their district, right? That legitimately would get people to a park, get people to a school um, uh, that really would help the community. So uh, my hope in, in uh, supporting this pilot is that um, we can uh, see if uh, we can uh, do a better job uh, and uh, delivering on these smaller projects. Um, I think it's within the spirit and intent of the original legislation. I really do see the merit of both the pedestrian benefit zone approach and the council district approach. And I really have been right on the line back and forth on this. And so I really do appreciate uh, it, what staff has proposed. I think it is the best path forward. Um, because it, it gives a time certain to address it, um, and deadlines are good, time, you know, a, a framework, a timeline, and um, we can see how we deliver on that, and if uh, the community is pleased with it, um, then we can continue, and if we've seen that it has not worked, uh, we can revert to how it was before. Thank you, Council Lady. Commissioners, further discussion? Commissioner Sims, I see you with, you with your hand up. Yeah, I just simply wanted to comment on a, an earlier comment about cities that have actually gone through studies like this. And there's uh, University of Texas, Austin actually did study a great uh, Austin, Texas, Charlotte, Houston, Minneapolis, uh, San Antonio and Seattle. And so we've got some good models in terms of being able to come up with an evaluation um, and performance based metrics that can give us a sense of whether it's this ordinance or another, how we actually do move this towards some type of outcome measures. Councilor Murphy. Thank you. Um, I, I know that Public Works is is committed to do the best that they can, and and that we have done. The Public Works Department and the Mayor's Office has brought on um, over the last couple of years, and administrations and this administration have brought on people who can really dig in deep to this data. I just, again, I, I got to voice a little bit of concern that um, the the lag and delay time of when in lieu uh, payments are done and when pro and how long it takes to design projects, um, how many projects do we have shovel ready, um, how many projects uh, that should be a priority are shovel ready, um, and, and that sort of thing. I'm just again, I'm concerned that the report, um, that, that a year is not, it would be accurate. I mean, like if I paid my in lieu fee tomorrow, um, my in lieu fee, I'm, I don't think, or if, even if we track, it would be, you know, put into a sidewalk within a year. So, so my concern is, is that 
where I think that Council Lady Robert, Council Lady Henderson, the staff of Public Works and Planning have definitely like done a lot of work on this and I've thought through a lot of scenarios. Um, I'm just not completely sure that this is the best um, the best path forward. And so again, I guess I guess if I could just hear a little bit more of, of how quickly if 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 I tr if I pay my in lieu fee, how long does it take for it to be uh, turned into to concrete being poured if we know that? Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I do have a follow-up question. Uh, I don't know, uh, either Public Works, Jeff Hammond, or maybe Council Lady Henderson or Council Lady uh, Roberts. Uh, uh, Council Lady Henderson uh, raised a really interesting point uh, because uh, by changing uh, Council District approach, so she said uh, we'll have a shovel ready, uh, more shovel ready, in you know each district but my concern is if we do kind of break up in lieu in each uh, council district depending on where the uh, in lieu fee came from wouldn't it have uh, uh, two concerns one do we create inevitably uh, in uh, inequity, try to promote equity, but because of uh, disproportionately in Luffy comes from, therefore, uh, kind of create inequity. And two, uh, how quickly uh, the shovel ready project uh, will be like a really shovel ready. I understand uh, 2019, it was 3.6 million, but, uh, you know, among six uh, point 3.6 million, how was it distributed? And if it was distributed, you know, certain uh, pedestrian zone, and with it, uh, did it promote it more connectivity? And if we break down to uh, council district, do we face uh, like a more breakdown and not uh, promoting connectivity. So those are the, my two concerns and question right now. So if anybody can answer that, that would be greatly helpful. Mr. Hammond, can you take a stab at that? I, I will try, but both of the last two questions had at, at least as part of them an underlying concern or component that uh, our sidewalk projects take a long time to develop, and there's no question these are these are capital projects that are that are we we say they're roadway widening projects that are that are really result in the sidewalk at the end without the pavement getting any wider. But we're doing all the same things: buying property, relocating utilities, um, negotiating all of that right of way, and and so forth. Um, and, and so is, but I, but I would I would remind you that 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 question about how long it takes to develop those projects is is almost irrelevant because when you pay an in lieu of today we don't take that money and go develop a project around it we take that money and put it on a project that is already under construction and so hypothetically if someone were to pay in today we're almost at the end of the fiscal year that money will be wrapped up and attributed to a project here in a couple of weeks now if you paid it after july 1 that's another story. It's a, it's a, it's been sitting there for a year, accumulating with all the others that come in in the course of that fiscal year, and then at the, at the end of that that term, that is then attributed to a project already under construction. So, uh, we certainly uh, admit these projects take a long time to, to develop and design, plan, and finally construct. Um, but, but we wouldn't be changing any of that under under this process. In fact, what we're trying to do is is formulate smaller projects that um, uh, allow these funds to be put to use quicker because, uh, you know, striping a crosswalk takes uh, practically no engineering, certainly not compared to designing a sidewalk, um, a signal push button or a curb ramp or, or similar. So um, we, we believe we, we can get some efficiency there and put the, put the money to use uh, more quickly. In terms of the equity aspect, um, that's, that's a little hard to say if we're creating inequities or not. I think in, in some ways it works both ways because I might be taking, under the current situation, I might be taking uh, in lieu of money from 
from an underdeveloped area that happened to get a little in lieu of money and be putting it into a very affluent area. It, it, it just ha- it just kind of works with the projects that we happen to have uh, uh, under development at that time. So um, I, I don't know if there's a, if there's a specific question. We can we can give you um, information about you know what what projects those monies went to by district or by pedestrian benefit zone or or however we have provided a lot of that information uh, to the planning department. Thank you. Council Lady Henderson, are you still on? I know you were sort of addressed in a couple of these observations and comments. Would you like to, to respond? Yes, Chair, I appreciate that. Um, I concur with uh, Mr. Hammond and uh, I think, uh, you know, regarding the 3.6 million i mean that really is uh somewhat of a kind of a bonus to um you know the the 30 million that we have historically applied towards uh these larger uh capital projects and so you know the the prioritization system uh for the larger capital projects um you know equity factors among those um but you know from a prioritization standpoint uh, as outlined in the walk and bike strategic plan whether it's for a large, uh, you know, sidewalk capital project, you know, just a major roadway stormwater, um, you know, delivery on that inevitably is going to be a much longer time frame with right of way acquisition and, and so forth. Um, that, uh, from an equity perspective, I would assert again, kind of going back to my earlier comment, in all 35 districts, a council member could tell you a place where. There are children who cannot cross the road. There are seniors who cannot get to their YMCA. I mean, we really are that behind as a city. So I think we kind of need to be working both sides of the problem. So, you know, I respect and appreciate the importance of um, objectivity and accountability and uh, major capital spending. But likewise, at the smaller end of the spectrum, I just feel that there are a lot of things um, that are falling through the cracks where they really don't kind of merit inclusion in the CIB, um, but, you know, they are just the, the striping down the crosswalk, the signalizing. I mean, things that are happening more in the, you know, 1,000, 2,000, 5,000, uh, you know, 15,000 space, you know, just curb ramps, um, safe crossings. Those are essential for, yeah, as a pedestrian benefit to connectivity and all the goals of um, Nashville Next, this council, this planning commission. And so um, I would say it's, you know, you're not really kind of taking from one to its detriment. You're just working kind of both ends of the problem. And I think all that just helps build the network. Um, so I would say it, it is fundamentally equitable to be able to deliver smaller scale uh, projects. And I mean, I hesitate to even call them projects. I mean, these are things that are quick, um, quick delivery. Um, and absolutely, they should be objective, accountable, transparent, why they were chosen, proximity to a park, proximity to a school, um, all those same kind of uh, uh, community-based public engagement, walk and bike strategic plan metrics that we established to make uh, big capital project decisions, those, that can be utilized just the same for these smaller decisions. So, you know, it's not just, oh, you know, five little pet project crosswalks in every district. No, those those small projects will have to have, you know, the same merit. They will have to meet the need from a safety perspective, from an equity perspective, from an access perspective. Um, so again, I would just present it as kind of working both sides of the problem um, and, and not to either one's detriment. Um, whereas at present, I really feel like that smaller end of the spectrum where we can really deliver for folks uh, very quickly and enhance their safety um, we're, we're not getting that done. I really do feel it's a, it's a need. Thank you so much. All right, we now need a motion. So I would just remind the commission, we do need to take action on the proposal uh, for procedural reasons um, at this point.
Mr. Tibbs? Yeah, I, I think I understand you, Lucy, and what Lisa said, but basically what you're saying, we can't defer this. this we have to decide yay or nay, and I just wanted to make sure I was clear. I, I, think, I think you can always engage the council member about her interest in that. I would not want to speak for Council Lady Roberts, um, and certainly if she had an interest in deferring, then that changes the trajectory. But we are we have these rules in place that sort of keep keep uh, projects moving forward. She is at so may I just recommend to the chair that you call on Council Lady Roberts and just get a she, sense from her on timing. She has raised her hand, so we will go to her next. Council Lady Roberts. I would like for this to be heard today. I think that we've worked on this for so long. Um, Council Lady Henderson has probably five years going talking about this, and and I think I've worked on it for a year and a half or two. I think we really need to go ahead and move it forward, if at all possible, today. Okay, we are back to needing a motion. Mr. Tibbs. Okay, I'll I'll get the ball rolling if nothing else, right? But um, I I still say just based on what I've heard that uh, my motion it would be to disapprove. That is a proper motion. Do we have a second, Commissioner Johnson? Thank you, Chair. I second the motion. That is a proper motion and a proper second. We will take a roll call vote. Commissioner Blackshear. Um, aye. Commissioner Gobble. Uh, aye. Commissioner Johnson. Uh, let me be clear. So motion is disapproved. So it's kind of Correct. negative. <laughs> okay. So Correct. if I say I is uh, approving the disapproval. Correct. So, yes. In that case, I. Commissioner Moore. I. Council Lady Murphy. This is a. This is not an easy. An easy vote for me. Do is there a, a you, Lucy mentioned that we needed to give guidance in this? Is is there is it time to do that now, or did I miss my chance? Yeah, I think we have a motion on the floor, okay. and so and this is a motion to disapprove. So I don't think guidance would be allowed at this point okay. in time. Okay. Um, okay. Then um, I. Commissioner Sims. Aye. And Commissioner Tibbs? Aye. So the motion carries to disapprove staff's recommendation. So we are now on to our next item, which is item number 28. Lisa? All right, commissioners, this is um, Sean Shepard with the planning department. I'll be presenting the next item, um, which is item 28, case 2020Z009TX. Next slide, Lisa. So the, the item before you this afternoon is a proposal to amend um, the same section we were just talking about, but a different subsection, so section 172120.0 of the zoning code related to street trees. Um, specifically, the proposal um, would establish that when public sidewalks are required to be installed um, in association with multifamily or non-residential development located in within a center identified in Nashville Next, that street trees um, should be installed within the required planting strip or grass strip or green zone, um, depending on your preferred term. 
I will probably stick with planting strips for this presentation. Um, and staff is recommending approval of a substitute ordinance. Next slide. So before we um, dive into the specifics of this proposal, I wanted to give you a little background on how we've gotten to this point. Um, since adoption of Nashville Next, and particularly over the last couple of years, the council, the commission, um, Metro staff, and members of the public have worked on a number of zoning code amendments focused on some of the broader goals in Nashville Next, um, surrounding improving walkability and accessibility, um, enhancing the public realm, achieving good urban design and meaningful open spaces. Um, and one of the key areas of those um, updates was the, the updates to our sidewalk standard. Um, so you've just heard a lot about those standards, but um, Section 1720.120 establishes requirements for sidewalk construction. Um, they're triggered when certain thresholds are met based on the type and scale of the development or redevelopment project, um, and also the location of the site, such as whether it's along a corridor or um, in or near a center in Nashville Next. Um, in some cases, they must actually be constructed and installed. Um, in others, a contribution in lieu is an option. Um, but subsection 1720.120C includes the standards for installation of public sidewalks, um, and a reference to the technical specifications that determine um, the design of those sidewalks. Next slide. So the, um, the other sort of um, significant piece of legislation in this realm um, was an update to our landscaping and tree standards. Um, those are housed in um, Chapter 1724 of the Zoning Code. Um, and if you'll recall, um, there was an update adopted um, in September of last year um, after a significant amount of stakeholder engagement um, that increased the tree density requirement for certain kinds of projects and sites um, and refined the procedures for tree retention and replacement um, and other landscaping, um, sort of all with the goal of increasing um, Metro Nashville's tree canopy, um, which is an overarching goal of Nashville Next. Um, and I'll also point out while we're here that that amendment um, permitted developers and property owners to receive tree density credit for street trees that meet um, certain standards. Um, and also that during that discussion, um, you know, several times we sort of uh, discussed the fact that this was a first step um, towards some of our landscaping and tree goals in the city, but it wasn't by any means the last step, um, that there would be more work to come. Um, so next slide. Um, so after completion of that update, um, sort of all of the stakeholders began to look at what the next step should be. Um, and Councilmember Henderson has continued to engage with stakeholders and conduct outreach. And one thing that sort of floated up as a natural extension of the work we've done so far was street trees. Um, they basically link together our legislative efforts on sidewalks and improving the pedestrian realm um, with some of our tree canopy and landscaping goals. Um, and they provide a whole wealth of benefits for the public and for property owners, um, some of which are listed here, shade, stormwater management, um, just making it a nice place to walk, improving the built environment and everybody's quality of life. Um, the next slide. So as we began to think about um, sort of priorities for street tree installation, um, the focus shifted to Nashville Next Centers. And you're looking at the growth and preservation map um, from Nashville Next. The centers are all of those areas that are shaded in sort of orange or tan, um, depending on your screen. Um, so as you can see, they're all over the county. Um, the downtown area for sure, but we've got centers um, in a variety of contexts. And um, they are um, intended to accommodate growth, improve our public spaces, support transit, um, provide walkable access to goods and services. and so. Um, being located in or near a National Next Center is one of the triggers for sidewalk construction. Um, the sidewalks that are triggered in those centers um, would have some uh, width of planting strip or green zone as one of their required components. So the sidewalk um, itself, the planting strip, curb and gutter. Um, and we have already set up Chapter 1724 so that property owners can receive credit for street trees that they install there. Um, which takes us to the actual proposal. Um, so next slide. After um, coordination with uh, Councilmember Henderson, with um, various metro departments, including codes, urban forestry, public works, water services, stormwater, and others, 
um, we came up with this initial approach, which would be an amendment to add a new subsection, um, 1720-120C2. Um, this would apply to multifamily and non-residential development within Nashville Next Centers when sidewalk construction is triggered. It doesn't affect one or two family residential development. Um, and it does not apply within the downtown code, which has its own standards related to street trees. Um, but these, this new subsection would require that street trees be installed within the required planting strip. Um, the trees would be maintained by the owner of the adjacent property frontage. And um, the trees would remain eligible for TDU credit as we established in the last um, tree ordinance update. So that provision is unchanged. Um, and in addition to the internal coordination um, that led to this proposal, um, planning staff also conducted some web-based outreach with a, a web survey to try to gather some public input. Um, we notified many of the participants um, <coughs> of the previous tree efforts and previous sidewalk efforts um, that this survey was available, um, and then also just put an announcement on our website. Um, we received about 100 responses. And almost all of them were in favor of more street trees um, being provided um, in general. Um, the next slide. Um, the bill as filed included a minimum number of trees based on property frontage and a minimum size for those trees. And one of the things that we um, began to uncover as we worked through some of those survey responses and considered feedback from the other departments um, was that street tree installation is really context sensitive um, and those minimums are really challenging to standardize in a way that works well. Um, determining the appropriate number of trees is sort of a function of a, a whole lot of factors including the location of street lights and fire hydrants and driveways and utilities um, and even street trees on adjacent properties. Um, determining the right size and species and planting conditions um, is affected by the width of the planting strip, the soil that's there, um, even things like the light and the orientation of the site. Um, so given that we have centers all over the county, the character of all of them is a little different and is intended to be a little different. Um, they suit their communities. Um, it is really challenging to come up with a single minimum um, that serves all of those sites well. Um, the zoning code kind of commonly takes an approach when dealing with pretty technical issues like this of establishing a requirement for the infrastructure, um, but then referring to appropriate specifications that are maintained um, by a department that has expertise in that area. So for example, the zoning code uh, indicates when you should install sidewalks, but um, the width of the sidewalk, the depth of the gravel, the type of the paving material, the slope of the ramps, um, those details don't live in the zoning code. They live in specifications that Public Works maintains. Um, and so staff started to recognize that it would be appropriate to do something similar for street trees. All of those technical details um, should likewise probably live um, elsewhere. And so staff is recommending a substitute that would replace those um, minimums that aren't really serving any site particularly well um, with a reference to the Metro Nashville street tree specifications. Um, this document is currently under development that's being um, led by Metro Water Services. They will maintain it over time, um, but they're getting input from codes and urban forestry, um, public works, and planning. Um, under an executive order um, related to trees, Water Services is, is given a number of responsibilities related to Metro's tree canopy, um, including development of these types of standards and specifications. Um, and they're, they're kind of well equipped to do that. They have a um, sort of unique experience in, in handling the stormwater management manual um, with these sort of detailed specifications, with developing them, with um, refining them over time. Um, and so they'll um, continue to lead that effort, but the specifications will include um, details on installation, on planting and maintenance, um, and it can accommodate better the sort of range of site conditions and scenarios that exist in our centers um, and ensure that the trees are installed in a manner that balances public safety, um, the functioning of our infrastructure, um, and also the health and the long-term viability of our trees. Um, if we're going to have street trees go in, we want to make sure that they're successful. Um, so this document will have standards that address 
kind of all the scenarios and make sure that those um, different variables are balanced correctly. Um, next slide. Um, so as the, the installation of the trees in association with sidewalk construction and centers will take us kind of another step towards achieving our goals in Nashville next for walkable neighborhoods and an improved canopy and just higher quality of life, um, staff would recommend approval of a substitute. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Councilor Henderson, are you still on? Yes, sir, I am. Very yes, good. Sir, I'm here. We hate to interrupt your time in your mountain house, but this is important. Thank you for participating. Indeed it is. Um, I would, would not miss it. Um, I appreciate uh, Ms. Ms. Shepard's work and, and, her, uh, and her presentation. I cannot see the slide from where I am, but um, heard that in full um, and, and concur uh, with that. Um, and I, you know, I, I just do want to expand just somewhat on the, you know, the extent to which uh, I, I really do appreciate uh, staff's engagement. Um, uh, you know, Stephen Tibbet, the urban forester, um, uh, his assistant, uh, folks in public works. Um, we really have uh, had numerous uh, meetings um, uh, working through all this. I appreciate the community's uh, input, as, as Sean said, about you know, 100 responses uh, to that uh, survey. Um, uh, I've had the opportunity to meet with uh, Kim Hawkins uh, twice. Um, to, to discuss this as well. And so um, we've, we've had really a lot of, uh, of good uh, input on this. And so I think Director Kemp often says this, it's, it's very challenging, whether through sidewalk regulations or you know, uh, street trees as part of that, uh, to legislate for 532 square miles that have a lot of different uh, contexts. So um, I am, am confident that this is a good approach. Um, that the work on the specifications with staff is on track. And I think it's important that these, you know, they do track together. Um, so I want to express to you my commitment. Um, I think with any major legislative effort like this, whether it's the sidewalks or um, uh, uh, the, the tree bill, um, making sure that the, um, that what backs up the bill um, on, on the staff side, on the process side to implement the legislation uh, successfully is is Im imperative, um, and so you know the the conversations you're having about that inform the legislation. Um, the legislation progressing forward, you know, applies that 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 time to to get these things done. And so I feel like uh, we are on track, and um, I would uh, ask for your support. And I am here to answer any questions as needed. Thank you so much, Council Lady. We're now ready to take calls from the members of the public who wish to call in. Your screen should show the call-in number. As a reminder, please only call in on the current case. When you begin your testimony, please state your name, address, and whether you'll support or oppose the item. We're not able to display a timer visually, but we'll be keeping track of the two-minute time limit. You'll also be given a 30-second warning from Sean when your time is nearly up. Um, Lisa, did we receive any emails on this item? Uh, we did not receive any emails on this item. And did we receive any voice messages on this item? We received no voicemails on this item. All right. Sean, has anyone called in on this item? Chairman, at this point, we don't have any callers. I might suggest, as we did last meeting, that we um, take a pause and play some Jeopardy music in our heads just to give folks a time um, to call in. And then um, I'll chime back in in you know, 30 seconds to a minute um, and let you know if anyone has, has called. Perfect. Thank you so very much. Um, while we wait, this is Lucy. Um, I just I wanted to thank Council Lady Henderson for her leadership on this this issue. I think that street trees and our tree canopy is one of the most important features of any city. It's our health and our urban design quality. And I think one of the things that really sets Nashville apart from other peer cities of a similar size is the hilly landscape setting that we have and our street trees um, standards could be improved to match that beautiful setting. And I'm really appreciate her approach um, here to focus 
and prioritize on centers and areas where um, more urban areas where street trees can make such an impact. Did I take up 30 seconds? Okay, and we still don't have any calls. <laughs> Perfect. Then I will close the public hearing and open up the discussion by the commissioners. Commissioner Blackshear, we'll start with you. Sure, thank you. Um, I think everyone um, has the same goal of increasing the tree canopy. So, um, I mean, I, I like the substitute ordinance. I'm fine with um, the staff's recommendation. I did have a question for staff, and this is more really curiosity than anything major, but, um, and I appreciate what you said, Sean, about having the specifications be something separate um, from the zoning code and, and really referring those really specific items about the trees to what is termed, let's see, the Na Metro National Street Tree Specifications, um, which is prepared by Metro departments. And I'm just a little curious about if changes were to be made to those specifications, what is the process um, for that? Commissioner, I think um, I might ask Councilmember Henderson to chime in here as well. Um, you know, Water Services is sort of leading the charge for us on this document, and they have um, a lot of experience with how they um, handle specifications and developing them and changing them and communicating all of that with the public over time, um, just from their stormwater work. Um, so I expect that they will follow sort of similar procedures with this update. Um, but Councilmember Henderson, would you like to speak to that as well? Or Yes, um, I, I do uh, concur with that. I think uh, Metro Water has a very uh, established uh, process um, for their, you know, their, their stormwater regulations and standards. Um, you know, when they do update those, uh, there's, uh, you know, public notice of that. They do have um, an email list uh, particular to, you know, the development community where they, um, you know, notify them as such. Um, and so that's, a, it's a, a well established within that department um, to be managing those standards. And I think uh, Ms. Shepard alluded to it earlier, uh, you know, through both the executive order uh, related to trees, um, through the leadership of uh, Director Potter, um, uh, he has really strongly asserted that, you know, street trees are stormwater infrastructure. Um, uh, they absolutely engage the, the public workspace and, you know, public works itself also has, uh, you know, their engineering standards. Uh, but I would say uh, the uh, water department has really systematized how they inform and update uh, their standards uh, in good, transparent public view. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Yes, that did. That was very helpful. Thanks, Council Lady. Commissioner Gobble. Sorry, I couldn't find the mute. Um, yeah, I, I think this is a good program. It seems like it's logical, especially if we can count that as part of the development of the trees. It's good to have them along the street. So I tend to, I want to listen to the other commissioners, but I tend to support it. Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Council Lady Henderson for uh, her leadership and hard work, and as well as our uh, planning staff's uh, work on this uh, tree ordinance. And I think we are going into the right direction. And I especially appreciate uh, specifying owner of the property uh, who install shall uh, maintain the tree. Because uh, previously, uh, when we are discussing uh, tree density ordinance uh, at the workshop, you know, who's going to maintain the tree? You know, once uh, uh, planted, nobody, you know, maintain and uh, it, so many tree dies and so forth. And so this ordinance uh, specify who's going to maintain. And so that's a good thing. So hopefully, uh, by the time Council Lady Henderson concludes her term, maybe we can address uh, single, uh, you know, one and two residential home, uh, the tree regarded to one and uh, two family uh, home. So that would be a great thing. So I look forward to having more tree ordinance coming to our way, and I tend to support. Commissioner Moore. 
Thank you. Um, I'm certainly in support of this and I'm really appreciative of Council Lady Henderson and the staff's work that went into this is very well thought out. Um, and like um, Commissioner Johnson, I look forward to seeing more um, tree legislation coming forward. Council Lady Murphy. Thank you. Um, you know, one thing that sets my district apart from from others and is how so many old growth trees exist um, because my neighborhoods, especially Richland West End, focus on planting trees every year and the right of way and the median and all over. So we have those multi generational trees because if we if we don't do that, you know, you, you simply at one point they'll all fall over. Right. And so I'm really, uh, I think this legislation is a great next step. I know that uh, last term over the summer, we, the council passed some, some tree legislation that, that achieved some of the kind of, some, some of the other low hanging fruit, if you will, goals. And that um, this is another step in that direction. And so, because oftentimes trees are, are what are tossed in last, not fully watered, all of that kind of thing when it comes to to planting and development. So I'm excited to, to see all of this come into effect and be more intentional about what types of trees go where and why. Um, and so I think this is a prime example of where Council Lady Henderson has, has taken some slower steps and, and quite possibly is achieving her goal faster than, than otherwise. And so I, I'm just, I am excited for this and I'm ready to support it here in a council. Thank you. Commissioner Sims. I agree with everyone. I want to thank um, particularly Sean, you, the way you explained this was great and uh, Councilwoman Henderson, but I also want to thank Berkeley Allen. I know she's cared a lot about trees and she's a co-sponsor of this bill. And I want to thank you specifically for addressing the minimum. Uh, the ambiguity of that was bugging me and you addressed it. So thank you. Commissioner Tibbs. I also uh, agree with everything. I because we're not in our typical um, setting, I'm not sure if you've gone through everybody, but uh, I will uh, make a motion to approve. And if there's someone else on the list, they can also talk, talk before no, there's a second. No, you are the last one. That is a proper motion. C Council Lady Murphy? Like to second. We have a proper motion and a proper second. Quick roll call vote. Commissioner Blackshear. Aye. Commissioner Gobble? Aye. Commissioner Johnson? Commissioner Johnson? Aye. Commissioner Moore? Aye. Commissioner Murphy? Aye. Commissioner Sims? Aye. Commissioner Tibbs? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you so much, Council Lady Henderson, for all your efforts on this matter. <clears throat> all right, we are on. Thank you, Commissioners. Thank you. I appreciate it. I item 32, Lisa. Okay, um, this is Abby Rickoff, and I will be presenting item 32. Next slide. The re this request is um, to rezone property from RS5 single family to one and two family residential alternative, R6A, uh, zoning for property located at 720 Lena Street. Next slide. Uh, staff recommendation is to approve. Next slide. The site comprises 0.14 acres and is located on the east side of Lena Street, south of Booker Street, and east of 28th Avenue North. The property contains a residential unit and is served by uh, rear alley number 938 um, at the rear of the site. Next slide. The surrounding area um, south of Booker Street includes mixed one and two family residential units and vacant properties with non-residential uses concentrated um, near Clifton Avenue uh, to the south uh, at the intersection of 28th and Clifton. Next slide. 
The R6A zoning district is generally supported by the urban neighborhood evolving policy, um, such as in an urban neighborhood such as this site. This area is served by a highly connected network of streets and alleys, uh, and the site is located um, less than a thousand feet from several existing bus stops along 28th Avenue North. Uh, the site is also located um, less than 500 feet from 28th and Clifton, uh, which are both identified on the major and collector street plan as arterial boulevards and collector avenues, respectively. Next slide. The A district standards will require design and bulk placement uh, standards consistent with an urban development pattern, and therefore staff recommendation is to approve. Thank you so much, Abby. Do we have the applicant on the phone? Yes, we do. Yes, Chairman, they're here. Very good. Applicant, if you'll state your name and you'll be given 10 minutes, please proceed. Um, my name is Ben Jordan. I live at 1011. Yeah. 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 And, uh, we are the applicant for this. Um, and first of all, thank you, uh, commissioners, uh, council members, and planning staff for um, your service during this very difficult time. Um, our application was was uh, was submitted, and uh, we think it was most appropriate for um, the T4 uh, neighborhood evolving policy. Um, we agree wholeheartedly with uh, planning staffs. Uh, recommendation for approval, and we're asking for that approval. Uh, we believe that it's consistent uh, with the pattern that has been started by the policy and directed by the policy. Uh, we also ask that you support it uh, because there's an existing infrastructure infrastructure that supports this type of uh, zoning. Um, that's pretty much straightforward. Um, we think uh, it crosses all the the T's and dots all the I's with this particular pol policy, and we just ask uh, for your approval. And I'll reserve any time left uh, in the event there is opposition. Very well. We'll reserve two minutes for a rebuttal uh, if you do need it. We're now ready to take calls from the members of our public who wish to call in. Uh, your screen should show you the call in number. As a reminder, please only call in on this particular case. When you begin your testimony, please state your name, address, and whether you'll support or oppose the item. Uh, and remember that we do not have a timer displayed, but Sean will be keeping track of time and give you a 30-second warning when your two minutes are up. Uh, Lisa, did we receive any emails on this item? Yes, we did receive one email in opposition. And did we receive any voice messages on this item? We received no voice messages on this item. Very good. Sean, do we have any callers lined up in the queue? Chairman, we don't have any callers at this point, um, so we can just take a brief pause and give folks a, a chance, and I'll chime back in in just a few seconds. Chairman, we still do not have any callers for this item. Very good. I will declare the public hearing closed. Um, we'll start the commissioner discussion, and I will start with Commissioner Sims. I knew you were going to do that, Commissioner Haynes. Um, I have a question, I guess, to the council person or maybe to the staff. Was any kind of meeting called or was there any kind of virtual meeting in terms of the neighborhood? Abby, can you take that? Sure. Um, I'm not aware of a public meeting. Um, the council member, if, if he's still on the line, may be able to weigh in, but um, I'm not aware of, of a meeting. 
Yeah, uh, during this time of when it's very hard for communication to go on, particularly in ur our urban neighborhoods, I am concerned that um, we did have one letter, but I don't know that the lack of letters or phone calls is necessarily a result of, of their apathy or their approval. And I think this may be just a bad timing. And I know that the North Nashville Community Plan is precious to them. And so um, I, I just have a hard time during this time changing zoning, which is not a right without knowing that the community was engaged in it. Uh, because I know for a fact that once we start the process of single to duplex, it's not long till the whole street goes. I, I live on one of those. So um, that's all the questions I have right now. I want to listen to everybody else. Okay. Commissioner Tibbs. Um, thank you. I do agree with Commissioner uh, Sims. I do always feel a lot better when there has been a... Um, some type of a community meeting, especially on a zone change, uh, it just makes you know that kind of, as the applicant said, all the I's have been dotted and T's have been crossed when you have that. However, I will say, um, not based on that, but just based strictly on what it is, uh, I do feel comfortable with it. Uh, I know there is a lot of development um, similar to this area and this uh, is consistent with what was already approved um, for uh, this area. Uh, so with the um, T4, T4 neighborhood um, involving. So I, it, in general, I, I think this is, you know, in compliance. I, I felt like the, uh, you know, since the neighborhood was involved, it, this should be consistent. But um, so I would be in support. I, I wouldn't be uh disappointed you know if if it was deferred to have a meeting but um as far as just following the policy following what was planned for that area i'm okay with it very good council lady murphy thank you um i think i've said this many times before i hate um kind of one zoning one spot zoning I appreciate when the staff kind of goes into more detail of like why a spot zoning or just a one-off zoning makes sense in this area um, because I don't like patchwork quilt zoning. Um, it just doesn't make sense to me. I feel like if this is an area that is neighborhood evolving, then then maybe the whole, you know, the block should, the block phase should be rezoned or the area should be rezoned. I, I'm just not certain why we should do it for just one person here or there because I think later down the road, it either lends itself to um, the neighbors don't want it to be uh, a change, but so many uh, spot zonings have gone through that it's kind of the wave, the wave knocks the them over, or it goes the other way. You you lose your single family housing because it's it just gentrifies into into all duplexes, and so. Um, this this area does have an alley so it does have alley access front and back where so that makes me feel a little bit better because i know that staff and i've had conversations in the past about corner lots and how sometimes you know it's more appropriate on a corner lot sometimes to do a, a duplex in a situation like this but um i don't know i'd like to hear hear a little bit more and um and maybe we need to take more time on it thank you commissioner moore Thank you. Um, so looking at the staff report, it looks like um, the codes department has, it says preliminary determination that this site is not duplex eligible. So is there any point that that would change or um, I guess what led to that statement in the first place? Sure, so um, when staff has, gets requests to up zone property, we look at the policy and whether the request is consistent with um, the policy, but oftentimes when it's a request to go up a zoning district that does allow one and two family uses, um, we'll check in with codes sometimes to see if a determination has been made or if the applicant has already met with codes and make that determination. Um, and in this case, we, we weren't sure uh, if those conversations had happened. And so 
uh, we, we did reach out to CODE. They uh, made a preliminary determination that it was not duplex eligible based on um, a legal description on the deed. And that's, that's the information that we have at this time. But the applicant, um, of course, will have to um, meet with CODE and, and discuss further um, once they have plans to develop. Thank you. I was curious about that. Um, I think uh, I agree with um, some of Commissioner Tibbs' comments. Um, I really don't have a big issue with this. I, I do think there was room for some community engagement here, especially during this time, um, and ensuring that neighbors know what's going on. Um, but at the same time, I do know this is a, a neighborhood evolving um, area. Um, so I'll continue to listen as well. Commissioner Johnson. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I too was uh, curious about the cause of preliminary uh, determination. So if they were uh, cause uh, department determined duplex not eligible, uh, what's the path forward for the uh, property owner or applicant? Uh, would that be good? If this uh, zone change was approved uh, by council, uh, then uh, their pass forward will be to go to court's department and ask for the variance or just single home or what will be allowed to build uh, under R6A in this particular location. Hi, this is, this is Lisa. Um, so if, um, so again, that was a preliminary determination. Um, so if it was rezoned, they would have to go to codes to get a final determination. Um, there is a, um, a, a, a opportunity for an item A appeal of a determination by the zoning administrator, essentially that would go to DZA if there's a disagreement with the determination that's made. Okay, thank you. Well, it, it seems to me it uh, looks like, you know, uh, just one property, like one zone change in the middle of a single family zone. But then again, uh, this is uh, the neighborhood evolving area. So in that sense, either several property go together and change the zone or just go one by one and eventually uh, reach the policy goal. So for that sense, I too am a little concerned about uh, lack of uh, community engagement. But uh, policy-wise, uh, I think uh, makes sense considering uh, surrounding uh, area uh, a little bit north and a little bit south, they already have uh, several R6A uh, zoning already uh, here and there. So I do have a little bit uh, reservation, but however, policy-wise, I think uh, I can agree with our staff uh, recommendation. Thank you. Commissioner Gobble. Uh, I agree with Commissioner Johnson. I mean, there's a little anxiety around the edges of this thing, but it makes sense just from the, the uh, staff's recommendation makes sense. So I'm inclined to support it. Thank you, Commissioner Blackshear. Um, is it possible for me to ask the applicant a couple of questions? Sure. Okay. Okay, I didn't know if they were still on the line. Um, it's a little awkward not being able to see anyone. Um, I guess to piggyback on what some of the other commissioners talked about as far as community engagement, I would like to ask the applicant what type of, if they have made any type of efforts um, to engage neighbors, the community, um, and possibly the council member. I've um, met several times with the council uh, member uh, concerning this rezone. I've uh, requested to have uh, community engagement on several occasions for his usual meetings. Uh, this application was actually made in December the 27th. And uh, 
monthly I've requested an opportunity until we came into the COVID world. Um, but I did attend one meeting uh, that was at the uh, West Precinct um, approximately February, towards the last week or so of February. Uh, I was not um, on the agenda for that meeting, but um, I was just earnestly um, asked that he put me on uh, with any meetings that he had. Other than that, I only, uh, the only uh, engagement in terms of the uh, community has been through just the requirement, the statutory requirement for notifications and whatnot, but I've met and had conversation with uh, councilmen um, on four occasions um, regarding this, this application. Okay, well, I mean, that sounds good that you definitely have made efforts to um, engage the community. I guess the question is whether those efforts have been successful in engaging a large enough um, amount of neighbors where maybe other commissioners would definitely myself would feel comfortable moving forward. Um, just in general, I'm really sensitive about people uh, knowing what's happening in neighborhoods and feeling like they have a voice. And then obviously people who live in these neighborhoods understand them and know the, um, the neighborhoods much better than commissioners ever could. And so when they are engaged, I find that our um, review and conversations are just much more robust and much more thoughtful when they have been engaged. And I just, I don't know if that has been achieved to a level where I would feel comfortable moving forward on this um and i do find it just a little strange that it's and i understand the policy is neighborhood evolving but it still just seems strange that it's not at a corner um and it's not completely mid-block but it definitely is not at the um the very end of a block i don't know if there's any type of i don't want to put um anyone in a bind particularly the applicant who made earnest efforts and so i don't know if there's any type of timing restrictions uh, associated with this but i would feel more comfortable if there were some type of community engagement on this front and i don't know what that looks like um in this COVID world obviously a lot of it will probably have to be led by the the council member well if i may make another comment yeah um, go ahead applicant I've made as many attempts as possible to engage with the people that the council person would feel that would be the most um, vocal about this. And I've I haven't had an opportunity to do that. I will say that uh, in going through the neighborhood and I'm from the area, um, most of these uh, residents are renters. That doesn't minimize their voice in this uh, situation, but the owner actually has tenants in the property and um, um, he's engaged them and explained to them what's going on with the property and he has a plan for them as well um, in terms of just having them in the event that he decides to build there uh, in the future, he will give them notice and, and, find, and help them find uh, transitional housing in, in, in his other properties. Um, I don't know what that looks like in this environment, especially when we're talking about um, a teleconference with people that are on the margin uh, anyway, and, that, and that's not intended to minimize their voice, but the burden of, um, of uh, community, community engagement in this environment is uh, heavy, uh, and especially when our application was submitted in December the, December the 27th, and plenty of time to get at least one or two meetings in, and it just did not happen. And so we've already been deferred once. And um, we, if we don't have a clear uh, indication of how, what that looks like or any direction on what that would look like in terms of community engagement, I think it may be a little burdensome, um, but uh, I'm willing to uh, reach out to the councilman and see if he has any, any suggestions as to how we might uh, uh, satisfy that before we get to the council level uh, and before he has, has another vote at the council level. This is um, Commissioner Blackshear. I don't want to turn this into a dialogue, um, but I just have a couple of follow-up questions. Uh, I do appreciate that you've made 
several attempts. And you said you um, attempted to contact, you said some of the more notable leaders in the community. Was your response that they didn't respond back to you? Or I guess, where, where did those, um, where did those efforts go? Well, that was a part of the, the, my initial meeting with uh, the council member in his office. And he said that he wanted to fit me into a meeting, uh, but he just didn't know which meeting to fit me into. So I just started to read some of the, the one meeting that he did have that I, I was able to schedule to be there uh, to raid that meeting in, in hopes that, that he would give me an opportunity to speak, but that didn't happen because the agenda was pretty long. Um, the one uh, opposition email, I reached out to her and I asked the councilman's help with um, maybe putting me in contact with her and that was unsuccessful um, uh, from last month. So I just don't know what else um, that I could do beyond um, the, the councilman um, putting together a meeting in a COVID environment. And I just don't know what that looks like uh, given the limited uh, spaces uh, that could be used. And, the, and, and, and I think the bigger burden for this area in terms of just getting those people uh, to the table would be the fact that there's a technology gap uh, or a strain uh, for a lot of the people in this immediate affected area within the statutory area. Sure, this is Commissioner Blackshaw again. And maybe this is a question for staff. Obviously this is just a weird time right now um, and, I, and obviously because it's such a weird time, so much of what we are doing is dependent upon technology, which is dependent upon resources that maybe not everyone enjoys. Has there been any um, creative or innovative ways that you have thought about how to engage larger members of the public? That might be an unfair question, but I'm just thinking, obviously you deal with this on a day-to-day -day basis and may have seen some ways that would be more successful to, um, reach community members than maybe what the applicant has tried so far? Hi, this is Lisa. I, we have made efforts to provide people with opportunities um, to, we've set up a voicemail so that people could call in on the voicemail um, and leave a message in regards to any of the items that are on the agenda. Um, so that way, if they're unable to stream the meeting, live stream, they can make sure that their voice is heard in that way. Um, we also have um, opportunities for, of course, people to send emails. It's not unusual for at times for us to get letters. When we get those, we make sure and scan them in so that they're included with the comments. And the way that we sort of approach these things when we're in these situations is, I believe when we first published this on the last agenda, we had it on the consent agenda. We then received an email, um, the one email in opposition, and the approach that we've taken is that essentially we have told the applicants, you know, if you're on consent and we get opposition in that manner, you're automatically deferred when meeting. And so we, we have automatically deferred and, and then have put it on an agenda to be presented to give an opportunity. And, it, and when the agenda is published, it's indicated as, as that it will be presented to give people an opportunity to um, call in or further engage in the meeting. Um, which is, you know, which we gave the opportunity for tonight. So that's sort of the approach that we've been taking is when we get those letters, we've automatically been putting something to be presented. Got you. Thanks, Lisa. Um, one other question I have for staff. Um, I know that you don't like for us to use the term spot zoning and I'm not gonna use it, um, but I just had a question about whether it gave you any pause in your review for this um, this lot not to be on a corner and be in between other lots that don't have the, the proposed zoning as well? Um, this is Lisa again. Um, no, if you look sort of, and, and the zoning map is up on the screen right now. So if you look sort of at the zoning map, you do have RS5, but you also have Sort of little pockets of R6A. You can see um, on um, Batavia Street and on 27th Avenue, you see a couple, and we're not quite zoned out um, any further. Um, the land use is already also mixed in this area. So if you sort of see 
Um, so if you sort of see here where I'm pointing, I think you can see those. Those are sort of existing duplexes that are sort of throughout the area. And there are other also more traditional duplexes. And so this zoning map may not tell, tell the full story of the actual land use pattern that exists within the neighborhood. And so, you know, while we do look at zoning, we also sort of look at, um, we all also sort of look at the existing land use pattern. So we look at sort of policy zoning land use pattern. I'm gonna point again, let's look again at sort of an aerial here where you'll see there's some existing duplexes sort of in the area. You can see one here. Um, you also can see that there is um, a lot of vacant property um, sort of in this area, especially in this block. And that's something that we'll also look at when we're sort of making our determination. Um, so we sort of look at zoning, land use pattern, and then also policy. And so if we're looking at this from a policy standpoint, it is an evolving policy area. And one of the reasons that you would have sort of an area with a consistent block pattern end up as evolving is when some of those sort of things that I've just talked about are present. And so when we have a situation where you sort of have maybe a lot of vacancies, you already have a land use mix, then an area would be um, determined to be an evolving area. And we would expect to have these sorts of uh, rezonings. And if, if something is sort of consistent with policy, um, then we wouldn't necessarily see that as, as a spot zoning because this is what the policy would, it be, would envision. Does that help? Yeah, that was really helpful. Thank you. I, um, I, I guess my feelings on this item mimic those of perhaps Commissioner Tibbs and maybe Commissioner Moore say the same thing, not completely in love with it, but um, I do see one, I do appreciate the applicant's efforts in reaching out to the community and um, and obviously the planning uh, department's effort as well in engaging people. And we got an email on it. So obviously I mean, there are people who know about it, even if um, there are not a lot of, not any calls um, that were made today on the item. And um, to commissioner or council lady Murphy's point about um, the lot being in, um, not exactly in the middle, but sort of the middle of a block and not on a corner as you would expect to see if something is being rezoned. I think that um, you, Lisa, just uh, explained it in a way that was helpful for me to digest. Thank you, Kim Commissioner Blackshear. Other questions or comments from the commissioners? Mr. Um, Sims. Okay. Yeah. Um, how does this set kind of a precedent for other people that may say, well, I tried, but I couldn't get anybody to meet with me or I didn't. I think the problem we have with the pandemic right now is it is presenting unique challenges and we're trying to grapple with that. And I think we ought to do everything possible to make sure that the neighborhood has had a chance to meet with the developer and uh, the owner here and to have their um, voices heard. And I almost feel like we need to go to the extreme of that during this, even though this could be okay, it's still a zone change and it's still without any kind of, and lots of places are doing phone calls, they're doing Facebook. Um, and I think there are some chances here for us to really model that we really expect to bend over backwards before we'll do something in the absence of a more formalized approach to involving the neighborhood. Director. So we have been modeling um, community events and meetings with um, council members who've expressed an interest in openness. I think we've got a varying degree of um, interest and we've heard that at previous meetings where different council members are coming down, but we are um, working with several to, to figure out how you notice a um, a virtual meeting and invite folks to call in. So we're very open and understand that this is an area where we're learning and we wanna continue to approve. I, I think from a procedural perspective, 
um, as staff, we have been trying to go above and beyond to give folks an opportunity to comment. And so the noticing procedures that we provided here are the same that we would have before the pandemic. Um, and so, you know, by providing three different ways for folks to call in or to leave messages or certainly to pull an item off consent because we have one written email to me is quite stretching in a space where we, we are inviting people to comment um, and want those comments to shape our decisions. And so I would, I would just want to say that I think we are already in a, a very um, progressive posture when it comes to public engagement in this difficult moment. And I appreciate that. Yeah, I think that's good clarification for how far we are. With Council Lady Murphy, you've got your hand raised. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to clarify one of the comments that was made. Um, so, so I, it sounds like just like a typical development call that I get often is, you know, are we duplex eligible? And I say call codes, they call codes, yada, yada. But what, what I heard y'all say um, was that there could be deed language that restricts us from being a duplex. Uh, I just want to flesh that out a little more because like, are we, are we rezoning this and yet, but there's a, there could be a deed restriction, not even that wouldn't allow it if we rezone it. If, if somebody could flesh that out or if we know that information, I mean, I get that this is neighborhood evolving. Um, and so, so it fits in policy, but, and of course, if, if the councilman does not want this to proceed forward, he will sign the bill and, and definitely defer or withdraw it at the council. So I'm, I'm, I feel very comfortable with councilman Taylor because I will say, um, what I've heard here tonight is not typical of him. He is very responsive. He uh, he has a lot going on in his district. He inherited a lot going on in his district, and he has been over the top responsive. Um, I think, and so this is this is out of character what I'm hearing tonight. But so if we could just flesh out though a little bit about this deed restriction potential or possibility, if we know anything. Um, this is Abby. So it's not. Uh... Uh, it wasn't a deed restriction as far as the use. It's not, um, a, to my knowledge, a use restriction. It's based on the legal description on the deed, so the, the acreage and the the, um, the actual description of the property um, is what I was referring to. So that would be pulled from historical information on the property, such as older plots or that sort of thing. So it's, it's not a restriction on, on single versus duplex. Um, they base their their determinations on duplex eligibility based on um, older deeds or plats or um, historical information that to, to make their determination. Okay. Let me let, let me, me add. Let me add sense. Yeah. Let me add to but that. Yes, um, the the part of the code. This is Lisa. The part of the code in regards to duplex eligibility um, is pretty complicated. Um, essentially, they have to do a lot, codes have to do a lot of historical deed research um, and not deed in regards to, like Abby said, the actual content of the deed, but sort of how the property is described. Is it a lot, a part of a lot, part of a parcel, those sorts of things, because the number of times that something has been split can have an impact on whether or not it's eligible for a duplex. And so that would that would be fully up to the determination of the code, but but that's what Abby was, was getting at. Okay, that makes sense. I think we've had those conversations. Y'all have explained part of that before to me. So what I'm hearing y'all say is that if we if we do if we were to approve this and if if the council were to approve this, then they would be duplex eligible then regardless of the deed no no so the rezoning is only one step in the process and so essentially um, a duplex is a use that's permitted as long as it meets certain criteria in r6a and so if rezoned it's sort of the first step and then they go to then they would go to code and during the building permit process it would be determined whether or not they're actually eligible. It has to do with when the lot's created, 
Um, and so essentially codes took a quick look for us. We sometimes ask them to do that. And they, based on sort of a quick deed look, said that their initial interpretation that it was that it was not, but that was certainly not a final determination. And so if rezoned, then the developer would go and they would actually go through with the full research to determine whether or not it is eligible. So simply rezoning, it does not make it eligible, but it has to be rezoned to even be that sort of the first step of the process. And then they would determine if it meets the other criteria as established in the zoning code. I guess just personally, I wouldn't want to go, I mean, a zone change isn't like, you know, a, a cheap process to do. And, and it is time consuming as we've discussed this for a while and, and, and things like that. I would, I guess I personally would want to make sure that if I'm going to jump through these hoops and, and ask the commission to approve this and ask the councilman to have a community meeting on something and, and we rezone it or the councilman rezones it and then they find out they're not even eligible to move forward, I would think that the applicant would have done that before, um, you know, going, getting to the point that we're at today. So I'm a little torn. Um, uh, on, I think it fits the the community plan, but but uh, I I don't know if we're if we're spending time ch chasing uh, chasing our tail here potentially, and and maybe it's just best to defer and ask the councilman to uh, to uh, see if he can come next time and give us more information. All right. Any other comments or questions? All right, we will entertain a motion. Commissioner Sims. Commissioner Murphy. I'd like to move to defer. Uh, I guess I'll, I'll move to defer one meeting so we can get more information um, and hear from the councilman. That is a proper motion. Commissioner Sims. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, yeah, I second that. That is a proper motion and a proper second. I'll take a quick roll call vote. Commissioner Blackshear. Aye. Commissioner Gobble. Aye. Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Commissioner Moore. Aye. Council Lady Murphy. <clears throat> Council Lady Murphy. Oh, aye. Sorry, I thought I, I am, I'm sorry. I spoke before I muted or whatever. Yes, I. Commissioner Sims. <laughs> Commissioner Sims. Oh. You, you need to unmute. There you go. Okay. Uh, aye. Sorry. Commissioner Tibbs. Aye. The motion carries to defer one meeting. All right. We are now on to other business. Historic. Commissioner Tibbs. Uh, no report. Uh, no report from Parks. Uh, the executive report since. Commissioner Atkins and Farr are both off doing fun things. We don't have an executive report, director's report. Um, I just thank you all again for your, for your service to the city. Um, we do anticipate having remote meetings through the end of June, and we'll stay tuned after that um, with more guidance. Um, I did want to remind the chair that um, we have the election of officers um, coming up. Would you like for me to put that on the table now? Please proceed. All right, thank you. So first, forgive us for the oversight of not including this on the calendar or on the agenda. Um, the election of officers is um, an annual election, the second meeting of May. Um, many of you know that the planning department performs 
some very important uh, functions, or should I say the Planning Commission, excuse me, informs some very um, important functions in terms of our interface with other boards. And I think that that really highlights um, the professional expertise of the Planning Commission, the contributions and service of all of you. And so um, one of the most important things we can do um, in our elections of officers is nominate members to serve on other boards. Um, and we also have uh, an executive committee, and the executive committee is responsible for um, providing guidance to staff sort of on an as-needed basis about higher-level policy um, uh, issues, human uh, HR issues and the like. Um, and so there are um, five different appointments, and I'll just list those. Um, one is the chair. The second is the vice chair. Um, both of those serve on the executive committee. And so then there is a third spot on the executive committee. So I would call that the executive committee third, um, third representative. And then we have the representative to the parks um, board and the historic. So with your with your permission, I think I might just um, suggest that we begin with the nominations for the chair. And so the way that Chairman Atkins has um, handled this previously is to open it up to the commission and ask if there are any nominations and then the commission vote. All right, do we have any nominations from the floor? Commissioner Blackshear? Yeah, um, I think Chairman Atkins has done a great job, um, and if he's still interested in holding the position, which I would imagine he is, I'd like to nominate him um, to serve as chair. All right. Commissioner Sims? I second that. All right. Any other any other nominations for chair? All right. We'll move on to vice chair. Any nominations? Uh, uh, yeah, this is. Uh, are we gonna? Um, this is Quan from Metro Legal. Obviously, will we? Are we gonna vote on them one at a time, or are we gonna do? Um, uh, we'll, we'll uh, Councilor, we'll follow your lead. You tell us how to how to proceed. I think it makes we've got we've got one motion and we've got one second, so I think it may be a good idea to go ahead and vote on on that specific item. And I think the benefit of that is that would then take um, Chairman Atkins out of the pool to, to be nominated for one of these other positions. Okay, then I'll take a quick roll call vote for Greg Atkins to serve as our chair for the next year. Commissioner Blackshear? Aye. Commissioner Gobble? Aye. Commissioner Johnson? Aye. Commissioner Moore? Aye. Commissioner Murphy? Aye. Commissioner Sims? You could do it. Aye. All at once, Commissioner Tibbs? Aye. All right, so Council Lady Murphy brings up a good point. Councilor, can we vote on the rest of the slate at once, given the telephonic voting? I don't know, it would be disallowed. Uh, I think that's fine if, if that's the way the board chose, chose to do that. I, I just think it, it, um, my thought was that it would be a little bit complicated, but if the board is fine with taking it as, as one vote, then, then certainly it's not, it wouldn't be prohibited. Okay. Do I, do I hear any opposition from the commission to vote on this as one slate? All right, seeing none, we'll vote on it as one slate. We need a nomination for vice chair, Commissioner Moore. I'd like to uh, nominate Jessica Farr. Very good. Any other nominations for that? Seeing none, we need a nomination for Historic. I make a motion for Mina Johnson. All right. Seeing no other nominations, uh, we need a nomination for Parks. 
Council Lady Murphy. Thank you. I would like to uh, nominate Jeff Haynes. Very good. So that to remind everybody the slate for vice chair, Jessica Farr, for historic, Mina Johnson, and for parks, Jeff Haynes. What about the third member to executive? Do we need a nomination for that, Director Kemp? Yes, we do. Okay, Commissioner Moore? I'd like to nominate Lillian Blackshear. Very good. All right, so you all have heard the slate. I will take a quick roll call vote. Commissioner Tibbs. Aye. Commissioner Sims. Aye. Commissioner Murphy. Aye. Commissioner Moore. Aye. Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Commissioner Gobble. Aye. Commissioner Blackshear. Aye. Very good. Congratulations to all of you willing to serve again. All right, lastly, legislative report, Council Lady Murphy. Oh, okay, sorry, there we go. Um, I did want to report that um, Councilman uh, Dave Rosenberg is holding currently, as we speak, a Facebook Live community meeting on the home occupation legislation that was brought before us. Um, that was a commitment that uh, that we had made and that I had held him to uh, to doing that. And then um, it will be back at council, uh, I think, on the either the second or the ninth. I've got a, we've got so many meetings next in June that I've lost track of who I am or where I am some of the days. But so I just wanted to follow up and, and let y'all know that that will be, uh, that he has held that commitment and uh, is doing it right now. Perfect. All right, prior to adjourning, I wanna take a personal privilege. I think this is Commissioner Moore's last meeting and to thank her for her loyal three years of service. Uh, we will miss you. And miss, I know you will miss the lengthy, long meeting, but thank you so much for your service. Thank you so much. I will definitely miss uh, being with you all up until the wee hours of the morning. Um, it's been a pleasure serving with you all, and I wish you the best. And then I want to take a quick moment to continue to thank our IT department and all of the Planning Commission staff. I've had the good fortune through phone calls to talk to a lot of applicants, architects, developers uh, over the last 30 to 45 days, and they continue to sing the praises of how smoothly these planning commission meetings and the entire process is continuing, and that wouldn't happen with the dedicated team of IT and planning staff. So Lucy, to you and your team, thank you so very much. And with that, I think we are adjourned. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.